Heiko After Dark. Greetings, everybody. Howdy, JD. Hey, we got Jimmy De Palma. We got Jerry McPeak. We got Stanley. How you doing, Stanley? All right, Mike Lampkin. Excellent. How we all doing there, folks? I hope Mr. you appreciate Marshall. the tunage. The tunage is important here. The tunage is very, very important. Polly's with us. Yeah. Chris Coro, David Cruz. David, David likes the tunage. We've been grooving to Alice for quite a while here, for about good, well, for me, about a half an hour. <laughs> John Morgan. Mr. Morgan. All right, Jason Mangos is in the house. Good evening, Jason. Mike Miller. Mike Miller. All right, welcome. We got no wheels tonight. No wheel no wheels. We can't we're gonna have to postpone. Without without wheels, we have to postpone the class. He was hey, just you know, telling me he's got uh, power outage. Oh my goodness, that's not good. Yeah, that's yeah not he good. had Big storms come through his way, so. Yikes. Well, here's a question already from Jerry McPeak. Will my mask work against the hornets? <laughs> well, I hope we don't have to find out. <laughs> All right, that was Alice Cooper. School's out. I got to tell you, folks, it's been 10 weeks. Had you believe it's been 10 weeks we've been doing this? How fantastic is that? This is the last episode of the regularly scheduled Take O after dark. After this, all right, school's out, baby. School's out for summer. We're taking a two week hiatus. That's the right word, right? Hiatus? Not hiatus. Hiatus. Hiatus of the hiatus of those little animals that eat other. Never mind. Back right. to, I, I gotta go back to summer school. Oh, <laughs> by the way, yeah. It's starting in two weeks. We're gonna bring back Take O After Dark, the summer school edition. And we'll be going every other week. All right. And uh, we're gonna give you we're gonna pick the first episode. And um, uh, we just got John, John Messenbrink's blessing on this. We're going to pick the first class, and then we're going to crowdsource with you guys the classes after that. What do you want? We'll give you some choices, and you'll be allowed to vote, and that's what we'll do. And if it's somebody from, you know, if we got to get uh, someone from outside of Keiko to come in and help us teach, well, by Glorioski, that's what we're going to do. So that should be kind of fun. That should be kind of fun. And um, also, we'll be uh, again. All the all the the recordings are on Takeo's uh, YouTube page. Obviously, they're on uh, Go to Meetings YouTube. <laughs> Let's try that again. Mo, 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 Mo. yeah. Uh, they, they're on Mechanical Hub's YouTube page, and um, we'll find some other ways to get, where you can get those as well. So, all that kind of stuff is going to be available to you. And again, if you all notice tonight's theme is the Murder Hornets. Who, with everything that's been going on, we kind of got the short shrift. I mean, they were the next big thing, but you know, they just kind of got lost in the in the shuffle. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna give the give the murder hornets their due tonight. All righty, take O after dark. Say hi to Rick Mayo. Say hi to Dave Holdorf. Rick and Dave, say hi to everybody. Hey. Good evening, everybody. How we doing tonight? Hopefully, everybody's got themselves a a notebook and uh, and also a uh, one of your favorite cocktails if it's late <laughs> enough for you. If it's after dark. If it's, a, if it's after lunch, well, eh, whatever, you know, it's, yeah, we're yeah. all grown-ups here. Mr. Messenbrink, who just uh, uh, just uh, celebrated a birthday. Happy birthday, John. Ah, uh, thanks, guys. Uh, hello, everybody. Howdy. How many? How many is this, John? Can you can you can you tell? Uh, I don't have enough fingers and toes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so more than twenty. Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right, folks. Let's get this. Let's get this show rolling. Um, take go after dark, part ten. We're going to be talking about domestic hot water recirculation. As always, most of you guys already know how to do this. You've already typed in a little hi, hello, how are you? If you have not yet, just uh, if this is your first time, go to the little question mark cartoon balloon thing on your control panel. Click on that and just type in a hi, hello, how are you? Uh, anything like that'll be great. Just so I know that you can hear me and I know that you know how to do that. There we go. Excellent. Yeah, Very good. good, my man. That's how you're going to ask questions, my friends. And please, any question is a good question. Any question is a fair question. Uh, and as we have the past several, you know, since the past nine weeks, we'll stay on until nobody wants to talk anymore. All right. If you guys are done, 
uh, whatever. We we when we, what, we were on till we were on till nine thirty last night, right? About a good two and a half hours or last last week. night. Last night, last, last week. week again. It's been a. It's I've been in quarantine quite a while. Okay, it's <laughs> Probably blending. Yeah, for everybody else. Um, but uh, yeah, we've uh, we will go on as long as you guys have questions because that's what we're here for. So excellent. Um, and with that, let's just get this show on the road, shall we? All yes, right. And uh, again, the the we, we are tonight's topic is going to be domestic hot water recirculation done right. Domestic hot, doing domestic hot water recirculation is pretty easy, all right? It's not a hard thing to do. Doing it right, however, requires a little bit of understanding and a little thought. Uh, but there's several things you've got to understand about domestic hot water recirculation. We're going to go through all of those tonight. And, at the, and, and, and towards the end, uh, Rick Mayo is going to show you something really, really cool that can help you size uh, help you size some stuff really easily, all right? Help you size some stuff really, really easily. So uh, all that will be available to you this evening. So you're, you're going to dig that. You're going to dig that. So let's take a quick recap of last week. Last week was mixing valves, okay? We talked about motorized mixing valves with reset, the Takeo I valve. We learned a little bit about CV and pressure drop. We learned about what to, you know, how to pick a reset ratio for, the, for those things. So we kind of covered that in some really good detail and discussed a really good application, resetting off of the reset. If you have a, a modulating condensing boiler that's operating off of reset, and you have a couple of different installation methods that require different um, water temperatures, well, why not reset those lower water temperatures with an I-valve? You can, you know, one I-valve per valve uh, per, per water temperature, and then lower that water temperature even more and send even lower water temperature back to the boiler which makes the boiler really, really happy and really, really efficient. So resetting off the resets a really interesting idea. And then we finished off the night talking about how to get the most out of indirect water heaters. What do all these numbers mean? What do, you know, what, you know, how do we figure recovery? What happens if we put in a boiler that's size for the heating load, not maybe the domestic hot water load? How is that going to affect things? And how to get the most out of it using a tempering valve. So we talked about all that kind of good stuff last week. So this week, we're going to get into domestic hot water recirculation done right. First thing we're going to talk about is why do domestic hot water recirculation? What are the benefits to the homeowners, to the end users for this, for this, uh, for this concept? We're going to talk about some smart control options. Make sure you control these things intelligently. Like I said, it's really easy to do badly, all right? It, it's really easy to do badly. To do it well requires some intelligent control strategies, and we're going to show you an easy way to size your pumps because, yes, sizing the pump is very, very important. Very really important. important. Yes, very important. Otherwise, you're going to be going back and having to have uncomfortable conversations with your customers. So let's get to it, all right? Ready, murder hornets? Let's go. Those things are scary looking. Is that a <laughs> nasty looking bug? Good God, that is just creepy i don't care if it's blown up that's a creepy looking bug man so let's talk about why domestic hot water recirculation well do me a favor just chime in on your own uh just chime in here on your own if you all have to wait for domestic hot water to show up do you, when you turn on a faucet how long do you have to wait for water to show up if you have a recirc pump already you can go in and say i don't wait at all i got a recirc pump. go ahead and do that that's fine but if you um if you don't how long do you have to wait? Okay. So we got Greg's a few got it good. Yep, 10 seconds. That's pretty good, Greg. 20 seconds, 15 to 20. Whoa, three to eight minutes. Good Lord. What? Wayne. That's, Wayne. that's a long time. Two two minutes. Uh, you know, that's a that's that's a, that's that's crazy. As yeah. my as my daughter would say, that is cray cray. All right, that takes a while, man. It takes a while. And there's a lot of reasons behind that. We're gonna dive into that. But facts are helpful things as we get started down this road. Facts are really helpful things. Water heating is, depending upon where you live, water heating is either the second or third largest residential energy use behind heating and cooling. Uh, if you live in an area where there just is no heating, well, then it's cooling and then domestic hot water. If you live in an area where you have both heating and cooling, well, it's heating, cooling, and domestic hot water. Uh, it's either, so it's either the second or third largest energy use in any residence. And it can be anywhere from 15 to 25 percent of the overall pie. But as Tom Petty said, it's not so much that. People are okay with that. They pay that. 
it's the waiting that is the hardest part, or should we say the way waiting is the hardest part. And the newer the home, the longer the wait, all right? This is something that's kind of interesting. The newer the home, the longer the wait. And, and it's, just, it's just a matter of numbers, okay? It's a math problem. Uh, compare the, a median home built, let's say 2010 compared to 1970. Uh, the home is about, you know, 2010, the average home was about 2,400 square feet. Uh, in 1970, the average home was about 1,600 square feet. So it's about 75% bigger. The homes, the newer homes are about 75% bigger than something that was built back in the 60s. As a result, the distance to that farthest fixture is almost tripled, okay? It has almost tripled, about 30 feet back in 1970, about 80 feet as a, a home built as recently as, as 2010. And we've also doubled the number of hot water fixtures. On average, a home built back in the 60s, 1970, had a half dozen hot water fixtures. Now we have, on average, up to 12. More bathrooms, more uh, you know, uh, uh, utility sinks. You got all kinds of stuff. So we've got more fixtures. We have a longer distance, and we have you know bigger homes. Also, and like, yeah. And, when you think, and the other thing and, that we don't have, less people in the house. Think of that home in 1970. How many people lived in that house? Right? You're looking at five, six, seven people easily. Today mm -hmm. it's four. Yeah. Four. You can't have more kids than parents. <laughs> yeah. I, so, I did well, that. They doubled yeah. up on us. It was not a good plan. I got right. to tell so you. You don't have fixture use as much either. The fixture yeah, use well, goes down Dave, now with less people. What about Utah? <laughs> we got a lot of people in the house. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. On the average. Yep. So, so what we ha what we have here, people, is a math problem. All right, it's a math problem. Let's and let's just do a little bit of math here, sort kind sort of kinda. Uh, if you have more fixture units, that means you have to have more volume. You have to deliver more hot water volume. More volume obviously means bigger pipe. All right, you have to have bigger pipe to deliver that volume. Bigger pipe plus lower fixture flow rates, as mandated by code, means you have reduced velocity in that pipe. So bigger pipe plus lower fixture flow rates mandated by code means you have reduced velocity. The, 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 the water's not moving as fast. So if you have that reduced velocity plus the increased distance to those farthest fixtures, it takes anywhere from eight, it's approximately 18 times longer to get hot water to that farthest fixture today in a newer home compared to a home that was built back in 1970. And that is why Janet Lee was screaming, okay? And all the while that you're waiting, you're wasting water down the drain, you're wasting energy at the water heater. So we're waiting and we're wasting, all right? We're waiting and we're wasting. And when you when you add that up, folks, that's gotta sting, all right? That's gotta sting. <laughs> <laughs> it does cost money, all right? We are, there's money literally going down the drain here. However, it ain't a lot of money, okay? Roughly one third of the cost, with an asterisk on that, or let me put an asterisk on that because that's gonna depend on where you are and what you pay for water, sewer, and fuel, all right? So it, it's not life-changing money, but it's money going down the drain. Roughly one third of the cost associated with making and using hot water, Okay, that's the portion of your water bill that is hot water. It's the portion of your gas bill that's hot water. And it's the portion of your sewer bill that's getting rid of the hot water. Statistically speaking, roughly one third of that, if you're waiting and wasting, roughly one third of that cost literally goes down the drain. So you're not buying that water, you're renting it, all right? It's just going right down the drain and it's wasted. On top of that, the US Department of Energy estimates that the average family of four can waste up to 14,000 gallons of water annually just waiting for hot water to show up. Okay, you think about your, 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 your shower, two and a half gallons a minute. If it's taken somebody two and a half, three minutes to get, to get for the hot water to get there, well, that's, that's a good bit of hot water. We've learned to live with it, right? We've learned to live with it. We go, all right, I'll turn the shower on full hot and then I'll go do something else. I'll come back in a couple minutes. It might've got there in, in 35, 40 seconds, but you were gone for a couple minutes. It's just the way it is that, because of how we've learned to live with it. But again, the waiting is the hardest part. Now there's a guy that was waiting for his hot water and ran into some murder hornets, okay? <laughs> so the waiting is the hardest part. And when you think about it, there's two ways to actually propose domestic hot water recirculation to your customers. One is a financial 
uh, discussion that they're going to save money. That might be an iffy proposition, depending upon what they pay for their for their water, sewer, and 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 fuel. The other is is it, it's a convenience story. All right, it's a lifestyle thing. It's a convenience story. Why wait? Why wait if you don't have to? You know, and it's a simple conversation. How long do you wait for your hot water? God, about three, four minutes. Oh, I can fix that. Really? Oh, <laughs> let's talk. All right, and there, and then, and then you're off to the races. Now, before we get too far, too, too deeply into this, I want to get the, I want to get the trivia question out now. All right, Dave, what's our prize tonight? Do you remember? Tonight we were giving away a um the the, the hotlink plus e package for tonight oh it's the hotlink plus e Ooh, it's a biggie we're giving away a hotlink plus e domestic hot water recirculation package with where did i put it oh, i just had it here ah with the crossover valve and the smart plug and all this cool stuff so yeah it's that that's a great great prize and the trivia question tonight and what i want you to do is when you know the answer type it in all right and we'll give you the we'll give you the answer tonight. Anything any any uh, responses after that don't count. So get your get your response in as quickly as you can. Um, along with its manufacturing facilities here in the United States, Takeo also manufactures circulators in Europe. In which European country does Takeo also have a manufacturing facility for circulators? Pretty good question, right there. Pretty good question. In which European country? Does Taco also manufacture circulators? That is the Taco trivia question of the night. Good luck. So let's. Oh my God! Now that that can't be real. All right. That's that's sickeningly large. That can't be real. All right. That's gotta be photoshopped or something. Cause that's that's the size of a. Good, that's a good sized bird right there. My God. I hope. That's I think not it's plastic. Real. It looks you plastic. think it's plastic? I hope you're right. Yeah. That's a yeah. that's a big hornet. Good God. Look at the wings. Look at the wings. Yeah, okay. I'm with you. I'm with you. All right. Let's talk about the different types of domestic hot water recirculation uh, from a piping standpoint. The first is your basic trunk and branch, all right, with either a tank type water heater or a tankless type water heater with a recirc line, a dedicated recirc line that goes from the farthest fixture all the way back to the water heater with a circulator back at the water heater. Now this obviously has to be installed during construction or somehow fashioned in some sort of a retrofit, all right? Uh, but this is the simplest and easiest way to get her done, all right? And the goal here in most cases is to simply keep that hot water line primed with hot water. That's all you're trying to do with this. It's not a lot of folks will look at this and say, well, I've got to get the flow rate to the fixture unit. I got to have the flow rate. No, you don't. If you took the pump out there, would you get hot? Would you get enough flow rate to the fixture for, for hot water for, for whatever purpose you're using? Of course you would. That's why you go through all the pipe sizing stuff. The circulator isn't delivering hot water, bam, like that. The circulator is running to keep the hot water line primed with hot water when it is needed. All right. That's its job. Keep that hot water line primed with hot water when it's needed. So this is the easiest way to do it, of course, simply running that recirc line from the farthest fixture away all the way back to the water heater. Now, in some cases, when you don't have a domestic, you don't have a recirc line for your domestic hot water, you have to you have to use the cold water line as a return. In this example, you're doing it with a crossover valve, like the hot link valve that we just discussed. That goes under the sink of the farthest fixture, and then it simply uh, it has a it has a a, 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 a bimetal uh, se thermal sensor disc in it that will snap shut when the hot water arrives, so we don't get hot water in the cold water line because that would be dumb. All right, we get, a lot of that's the first question anybody asks. Well, what are you going to do about the hot water in the cold water line? Because we're going to keep it from getting there. All right, we're going to stop it before it gets there. So that's a, a very common retrofit application, all right, or done just whenever there's not a hot water recirc line, you can use this crossover valve underneath where code allows. There are some instances where, where codes don't really let you do this, uh, but uh, saying it's a cross connection, eh, then water's coming from the same place. So I don't know about that, but codes are codes. How try, try winning that argument. Um, the, other option is kind of the same thing, only different. This is using uh, the, the trunk and branch with a crossover circulator 
placed under that farthest fixture away. All right, that's the other option that you might have. Uh, so trunk and branch with a circular. Sometimes it's in the it's in a vanity under the under the, the in the bathroom, and you have a this this actually technically is probably used mostly with tankless water heaters because this tends to be an on-demand type of um, recirc where the pump is actually activated manually with a push button or a motion sensor. All right, and it's generally speaking a larger circulator because we're not keeping the hot water line primed. What we're really now trying to do is uh, just ev let's evacuate that hot water line of cold or tepid water as quickly as we possibly can and then shut the pump down. So let's you know make it in a matter of seconds. If, it, if we can get it there in 15, 20 seconds and then you open up the faucet, bam, the hot water should be there. Yeah. All right. It's a very effective and very economic way to do it, uh, but you got to have a pump under the sink. And then you have this example, which is a full-sized loop, uh, engineered plumbing, we used to call it structured plumbing years ago, where you simply have your hot water line and it's just a big one old, big old loop-de-loop, -loop, this more like a hydronic heating loop. Uh, and off of these multi-port tees, you feed the hot water fixtures, right? And you try to keep those feeds from the multi-port tee to the fixture as short as possible, maybe about 10 feet or so. Uh, so that's basically, you've got a cup of water. When you turn, when you turn a faucet on, you've primed that hot water line, about a cup of cold or tepid water comes out of the faucet and bam, the hot water is there. And this can work on a timer, can also work on an on-demand kind of, kind of a, an arrangement. So those are the different ways of doing domestic hot water recirculation, all right? When we talk about domestic hot water recirculation, we also have three different types of customers, all right? We have customers that don't like wasting, and or don't like waiting. So they either are a convenience oriented person or a conservation oriented person, or they could be a little bit of both. You don't know. Uh, that's the big, that's the big old fat part of the bell curve right there. They don't, they, they, they just don't like the idea of having to wait two or three minutes for the hot water to show up. They don't like wasting all that water down the drain. They don't like spending extra money at the, at the water heater. It's just none of that makes them happy. So this is, um, that's the big old sweet spot of the bell curve. Then you've got people who don't give a darn and you've got people who don't give a darn. Now they both, that, now those might seem, sound like the same people, but actually they are completely opposite. All right, those are two completely distinct groups on either end of the bell curve. That first group that doesn't give a darn, these are the people building their, their, their $97 million mansion and they say, I want hot water at any faucet in this structure at any time, day or night, and I don't want any excuses. And I don't really care how much it costs. Doesn't matter to me. I just want, I turn on a faucet, I expect hot water. Those are your marching orders. Don't care about the cost. Don't care about how much it costs to install. Don't care about how much it costs to run. None of that makes any difference, all right? So that's one, that's one end of the bell curve. The other end of the bell curve also doesn't give a darn. And these are the people that are, you know, they typically might be on, we, we would traditionally consider them home builders, but that's not a fair generalization. But they don't, they don't give a darn how it works or if it works or whether it works or what it costs to run. They couldn't care less about any of that. They just have to check off a box on a list. I got to have domestic hot water recirculation. Give me the cheapest thing you got. I don't really care after that. Not my problem. Just as long as I just as long as I have it and satisfy the requirements, I'm good. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Oddly enough, the same solution works for both ends of the bell curve, which we'll talk about in a second. So, so it's kind of the same, the same, the same solutions work for both of those. We, in the big old sweet spot of the bell spot of the bell curve, you've got some choices. You've got some choices. All right, how are we doing out there? We got a lot of answers, which is excellent. That's very good, very good. Any good questions that you see in there, Dave? And, and or Rick. Uh, no questions, just a couple of comments from people out there, you know, about oh. waiting for hot water and, and whatnot. Some, you know, some guys are saying they haven't timed it yet. They're learning to live with a tank list for the first time. That's from uh, from Wallace, from Jack mm -hmm. and uh, and things like that. So uh, just a couple of statements going up, but no heavy questions yet. So we're good to go. Good, good, good. And you know, we talked a little bit about this last week, too, about the tankless thing. And the worst thing you can call it is an instantaneous water heater because people think that means oh, it's instantaneous water heater. It's going to give me my hot water instantaneously at the fixture. And that, no, it's going to make the hot water instantaneously at the water heater. You still got to get it from point A to point B. That doesn't change with the, with the type of water heater. But a lot of homeowners don't understand that needs to be explained. All righty.
So how are we going to solve this here problem? Well, we got some, we got about four. Well, there's four ways to do this. The first way is with dumb pumps. All right, put in a dumb pump, man, and a, a dumb or a dumber pump. Either one doesn't matter. Just a dumb pump. Okay. <laughs> Next up on the evolutionary scale is a slightly less dumb pump, all right? This one's got a timer, all right? It's a slightly less dumb pump. We move up the scale. Now we have a slightly less dumb pump with an aquastat, all right? We're getting, see, as we're getting smarter and smarter and smarter. And then lastly, our last solution would be a dumb, quote unquote, dumb pump, but a smart control strategy. The pump doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be anything inside the pump if we have a way to make that pump a good bit smarter and learn and adapt and do the things you need it to do. So those are your, those are your, your kind of your four categories of domestic hot water recirculation. Dumb pumps, slightly less dumb pumps, a slightly less dumb pump with an aquastat or a dumb pump with a smart control. All right, let's talk about dumb pumps first. And these are just any standard double O series circulator with a line cord, all right? And here you see we have we have them in union, we have them in sweat connections, we have them flanged. I mean, there's all different kinds, stainless steel, bronze bodies, they're all out there. We, we, you know, make them, we make them all in all different sizes of double O's and they just have a line cord. There's no control or anything on it. There's nothing smart about it. You just plug it in and it goes. That makes the two ends of the bell curve happy for a while, <laughs> okay? That, that that makes them happy for a while. This thing, you plug it in, it's gonna run 24 seven, right? It's gonna run 24 seven. You're always gonna keep that hot water line primed and ready to go any time of the day or night. So they're thrilled. Uh, it's cheap, it's easy. So the low end of the bell curve guy is thrilled as well. Cheap, God, I, 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 that's all the cook. Fantastic, go for it. Makes them happy, however, be prepared to have an uncomfortable conversation with your customer. Some people who say, I don't care how much it costs, once they're hit with an electric bill and or a, a gas bill from having that water running through the water heater all the time and having the pump running 24 seven, all of a sudden they may say, whoa, what's going on here? That's not quite what I was thinking. Or what's the worst case scenario, Rick? I'm going to tee this one up for you, man. What's the worst case scenario if you have a pump running 24-7? Uh, potential erosion corrosion and you got leaks. You got a sprinkler system and now you got to go explain that to the homeowners because it's your fault. Exactly. Running a pump 24-7, especially hot chlorinated water is the kryptonite for any pipe. Copper, PEX, CPVC, you name it. It's the kryptonite for any pipe and it's just, it's not a good idea. All right. You better be prepared to have that discussion a year and a half down the road as to why do I have all this water damage? What the hell happened? Yeah. Okay. That's the downside. That is the downside. So to make a dumb pump slightly less dumb, we throw timers on there. Okay. This shows digital or analog timers. Most of the time it's an analog timer with those little dippy switches. Any dippy switch represents 15 minutes and you can adjust them to have it run when you want to. Uh, provided you set the clock appropriately. But there's two big questions here. Who sets it up? Is it you? Is it the homeowner? Who does the programming? And I'm not 100% sure what the right answer is, right? Because do you know their their schedule? Do you get that information from them and then you program it? Do you take a wild guess at when they think, when they might want to have it? Okay, we're going to have it run from six to nine in the morning and, you know, and six to nine at night. And after that, who knows? Or do you flip all the switches and have it run 24 seven? And at that point, what's the point? So who right. sets it up? That's the first That's like, question. Yeah, like programmable thermostats, you know? Exactly. Yeah, how many of them are programmed actually out there properly the way that people want them too? Yeah. Yep, yep. And then the other part of the question, which nobody seems to answer is, well, who resets it? What do you mean reset it? Well, who resets it? I'm, I'm, I'm gonna believe you have the occasional power outage wherever you are. Wheels is going through that right now. You have the going to have the occasional power outage, and what happens twice a year? We change the time. We go up. We we fall. We spring ahead and we fall back. Well, you got to reprogram them then, right? Nobody ever does that. What usually happens with these? We've seen they're either unplugged or they run. Or they run almost all the time. And at that point, they they become either a decoration or they become a dumber, a dumber pump. All right. And the, again, the question here is with a timer: Does it run when it's not needed? I mean, it just, it's a slave to the clock, right? 
Now, I've seen people, they try to get smart. They'll, they'll do 15 minutes on, 15 minutes off, 15 minutes on, 15 minutes off. And if you're going to do that all day long, well, that's okay. That's fine. That's fine. That, that's better. Okay. But that's, uh, that's a way around all of this. And that, it certainly can be done. So slightly less dumb pumps. Next up is a slightly less dumb pump with an Aquastat. It's better. It's better. The Aquastat, all right, it's a little strap on Aquastat that you wire into the control and you strap it onto the pipe on the return side of the pump. All right. So when the water gets hot to a, to a degree back at the pump, even if the, even if the timer says keep running, the Aquastat's going to say, shut off. We're good. The, the hot water's here. I don't know why we need to keep running. So it's simply going to shut off. So it's uh, ours is a high and low limit. It's 95 and 105, right? Uh, did I get that right, Dave? I think it's 95 and 105. So when the water temperature drops below 95, it'll let the pump enable again. It'll turn the pump back on. When it gets up to 105, that's when it shuts off. Okay, so it's a, a high limit, low limit. Uh, a couple of things. Again, you may be running this pump when there's no real need for hot water. It is still a slave to the timer, if you will. But also, really, the best place for that Aquastat is back at the last fixture. If it's a really long run, the better off you're much better off putting that Aquastat back at the last fixture because who the heck cares what the water temperature is in the in the recirc line, right? That doesn't make any difference whatsoever. We don't care what that is. The reason it goes right on the butt end of the circulator is because it's convenient. Well, the the, the wire is only that long. I mean, come on, why, why, it's, if I have to run this thing up somewhere else, I got to run a longer piece of wire. Well, well, yeah, <laughs> if you want to do it right, well, yeah, of course you do. I mean, that's like saying, well, if I don't run that, it would be a lot easier if I didn't have to run that recirc line. Well, yeah, but if you didn't run the recirc line, the water would just empty out all over the place. So it's it's one of those things, you got to think about an Aquastat. It, it, um, there's convenience versus the right place to put it. I get convenience. You got to do what you got to do, right? But if you want to do it right, that Aquastat actually does really do the do the best work uh, and is the most effective out past out on the recirc line right after that last fixture. Because that's when the hot water's there, shut it off. We don't need it to run anymore. If we're going to make use of this Aquastat, let's make use of this Aquastat. All righty. And then lastly, you've got a dumb pump with a smart control. And that is any circulator, whether it's an ECM 006 E3, very, you know, a, a, a infinitely adjustable fixed speed pump, or a 003 dumb pump with a line cord, no timer, doesn't matter. And, and, this, the, the, and this thing works with anybody's pump. You simply use the Taco Smart Plug, which is this guy, all right? You plug it into the wall, you plug the pump into that, and the brain in here takes over. It can either be set up to learn your usage patterns and then repeat them and relearn and re-repeat and relearn and re-repeat, or it can be set up to a pulse, which is five minutes on, 10 minutes off, five minutes on, 10 minutes off, 24 seven, whichever's gonna best fit the needs of the customer. It's the simplest way to make a dumb pump pretty smart actually. So we'll get into the details of that in, in, in a wee bit, all right? So I also want to talk about recirc lines real quick. How are we doing on questions there, gang? Anything coming in? There's a couple in there. Um, can passive recirculation piping system be installed on a tankless water heater? Well, Kevin, those tankless typically need a, about a half GPM to even fire. So unless you could get a gravity system to guarantee you more than a half GPM, you're probably never going to get any hot water. So, um, yeah. So what really else we got? To, somebody was talking about using quarter inch flex return line with no electricity with a Venturi fitting up uh, at the farthest fixture. I'd have to see that, Christopher, drawn out. Uh, apparently you've made it work for you. So uh, again, I've not seen that. I can't speak to it. So. Yeah, it's it's more like a gravity system. I've I've seen a lot of projects. Um, I've heard about it and talked to plenty of people that have worked on them. It's, you know, just getting that hot water falling. I mean, the hot water rising, cold water falling, but it will depend upon the piping. You know, you got to make sure it's going straight up. If you got a lot of horizontal runs, then then a lot of times that doesn't work as well. So I, I can see see some of that working without pumps on there. But, you know, the one thing about adding a circ is now it's controlled. Everything right. else was uncontrolled. Exactly. Now we right. have control over it, what it does. Right. 
Hmm. Uh, I see a question here from David Cruz. Can how the water flows during recirculation? Um, yeah, I, I, Dave, you answered, yeah, but I can go back and and do uh, do a couple of uh, quick uh, sketches if you want. If that they were color help. coded. Yeah, they were color coded. Yes, let's go back here. Boom, boom, boom. boom. Oh, there's the big old murder hornet. Yeah. If we take a look at this, okay, here's your hot water line, okay? And that's going to all your hot water fixtures. So follow that all the way out to the last fixture. And then when we go yellow, okay, the yellow line is your return line, all right? And it comes all the way back, all the way down here, and then it comes right back, and here's your here's your recirc pump at your water heater, all right? So I don't know if that if that helps uh, clear it up a little bit a little bit there there Dave. Uh, the the trunk and branch with the crossover valve and with the circulator are both going to work the same way. Uh, here you have a circulator, okay, pumping out of the out of the hot water tank, and the hot water comes to here, and just piped in below the where the fi where the fixture connects to the to the to the to the angle stops. We have our crossover valve, and what happens is we simply you it crosses over. We use the return line. The cold water line is a return line. Until the hot water gets to the valve itself, there's a little thermal sensor disc in there that will that will that will quite literally snap shut. So we stop the hot water from going into the cold water line. So hope hopefully that help that helps uh, helps you kind of get an idea of what that that's all about, Dave. Thanks for the question. Yeah. So in that drawing there, the the water flow is in both directions, not at the same time. But <laughs> when we have the the crossover style, it, the water flows in the blue line in two different directions. So that's why it was hard to put the arrows on there. And we'll right. get into the details as we start talking about uh, each one of those systems in more detail too. Yeah, and and think about how much water goes does actually cross cross over because you know it it, it uh, how much is actually going to depend on how long this line is whether it's insulated or not, all right, and the size of the pump, basically, and we usually sell this with a 006, which is generally fine, and what'll happen is, you know, let's say we have one at this fixture, okay, and let's say the water starts cooling off here, here, here. Well, we gotta, we've got to pump that hot water all the way through, so all the water in this pipe that's cold or tepid will pass through and go this away, all right, and that's cold or tepid, just regular, you know, it's whatever's in the pipe that, you know, that's that's become ambient at that point. And then, and it's going to be not going to be all that different from what's in the cold water line either at that point. Uh, and then once, and this is with the circ, this is with the circulator, but once the valve closes or the circulator stops, well, then we're done. And they they both are very good at stopping when the hot water arrives. And then again, the hot water generally doesn't, if you think about it, it's cold, tepid, cold, tepid, cold, tepid. Then it starts to get a little warmer, a little warmer, a little warmer, and then bam, the hot water's right there because we've turned the pump on, right? Uh, that's kind of how that works. And once it's closed, it's uh, once the valve is closed, it's closed. Once the once the uh, the, uh, the the circulator stopped, it stopped. So it, it kind of we minimize the amount of hot water in the cold water line to the point of if you were to turn on the cold, if you were to turn on this cold water spigot. The hot water might, in fact, be gone by the time you get your hands under the faucet. If there is any, if it's even hot, it's going to be warmish at best, because it, 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 that's just kind of how it, how it all works. So it's it, it we do a very good job of minimizing the the amount of hot water in the cold water line to the point of being you know almost insignificant. Okay. Alrighty then. So we went through the dumb pumps. The not so dumb pumps. Okay, whoops, there we go. Ho, ho, ho. Let's talk about the Hot Link Plus. All right. Now, the Hot Link Plus E is, again, it's if you have no recirc line. All right. Uh, and includes the 006 E3. All right. If you take a look at this circulator right here. All right. Oh, you, I'm just ruining the surprise on the next one. There we go. It's a, it's a, it's a volume dial. Okay. The more you move it to the right, the faster the pump goes. The more you move it to the left, the slower the pump goes. All right. And there are little notches that represent the 006 or the 003, but you can kind of go anywhere in between. And um, it's an ECM variable, it's an ECM circulator. It's variable speed, but what you're doing is you're setting and adjusting a fixed speed. It uh, had, you know, the, the kit comes with hose connectors uh, for the hot link valve and uh, union adapters for the circulator itself, as well as the smart plug. Now, first things first, just the the 
the valve itself, I mean, we were we we worked really hard on on this to 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 really deliver one that 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 actually works in that it has it's field it's truly field serviceable. This cartridge is hand tight, it should only be hand tight and cleanable if need be. And this is just a you know the plastic housing. Right on top here, you see a thermal sensor disc, and this is the thing that will literally snap shut when the hot water reaches the valve, and it'll close off flow basically like that. All right, so it's a it's a pretty nifty nifty little little uh, little valve, and you can buy it by yourself as a replacement for other valves because you know why replace a, a valve that that wore out every 18 months with another valve that's going to wear out in 18 months? Might as well use something that's going to last. So it's available by itself, but also as part of the kit. The smart plug is this guy right here. The smart plug, as we said, plugs into the wall outlet, and then you plug in your circulator right here. And it comes with a um, sensor, all right? It comes with a sensor that you strap on the hot water line as it leaves the, uh, the mechanical room. You strap that on the hot water line, and then it plugs right into the bottom of the, uh, into the, bottom of the, of the, the, the unit itself. In, and there's a couple of modes here. There's learning mode and there is pulse mode. If you leave it in learning mode, if you leave it in learning mode, what it's going to do is for the first week it's installed, it's going to pulse 24-7. Five minutes on, 10 minutes off, five minutes on, 10 minutes off, just to keep that hot water line prime. But it's also learning. So let's say you get up six o'clock Monday morning and take a shower. All right, that's going to register as a hot water event. All right, and it's going to measure an event as a rise in temperature, a sustained use, and then a drop as measured by the sensor. So it's going to remember, okay, six o'clock Monday morning, dude got up, took a shower. Let me remember that. All right. And then it remembers what happened later in the day. And then it remembers what happened Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It has a different schedule for every day of the week. The following Monday, we're out of pulse mode. Pulse mode is over. And what it's going to do is, all right, I, the guy took a the, the guy took a shower at 6 a.m. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start pulsing at 5 a.m. So dead off now, 5 a.m. Bam! I'm going to turn this pump on and I'm going to do five on ten off, five on ten off for a two-hour period between 5 a.m. and 7 a.m. So if he gets up a little earlier, if he gets up a little later, I got him covered. All right. So you're going to keep that hot water line prime for that two-hour period, and the pump only runs. 40 minutes out of 40 minutes out of 120 all right so again uh 40 to 5 10 15 yeah 20, 40 minutes out of 120 um so it's the pump is more efficient by itself it's running more effectively by itself and we have a valve that's going to work okay so that's kind of a neat thing and then it's going to constantly relearn as well the, the significance of that two hour window is not only not only has to do with um with uh 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 getting up earlier or later, but also when we spring ahead or fall back, you'll still be covered, more or less, okay? You'll still be covered. So that's kind of a neat to, a neat feature uh, in that. When, you, uh, um, when you, you lose power, when you have a power outage, it goes back into the learning mode yet again and relearns. It has a, um, it has a, uh, a vacation mode. So if it senses no usage for, uh, I think it's a period of 72 hours, it shuts off, okay? So it's just not running anything. And it'll exercise the pump one maybe once a week or so to to keep that to keep that uh, the water from getting stagnant. Uh, but that but it has that it has a built-in vacation mode as well. Have I left anything out, boys? Uh, it's 36 hours of no use and 72 hours had to do with something else. Uh, the uh, actual uh, exercise. Right, that's right. It, it exercises every 72 hours. It's 36 hours of no use, a day and a half. Thank you. Thank you. I, Day and a half of no hot water use. It figures someone's on vacation. Very good. Thank you about that. All righty. But that's the that's the smart plug. And again, this is this can also be purchased by itself. And it's a terrific little add-on. If you've got a customer that has a dumb pump or a dumb pump with a timer, say, let's let's smarten this thing up for just a little bit of you know super simple installation. You know, very you know very easy on their wallet as well. Uh, I can turn this this dumb pump into a smart pump pretty darn quick, and it doesn't matter what color the pump is. This works on anybody's pump as long as you plug it in. All right, it's got as long as it's got a line cord, you plug anybody's pump in here. Um, and we've been, I mean, this thing, this thing's been a, a grand slam home run for us from day one. 
really neat. And this thing actually won the 2017 AHR Innovative New Product of the Year Award at the AHR trade show. And that there were there were products from these huge companies, uh, you know, big, big tower chillers, things I didn't even know what the heck they were. And then this little guy kicked their butt because the, the powers that be figured this thing had the potential to help more people than anything else that, that was at the show. Yeah. So we were pretty excited about that. Absolutely. Yeah. All righty. Now, tankless. If it's tankless, we have to summon the genie. Is it Barbara Eden? What do you guys think? Oh, man. That's what I was dreaming of. I dream a genie. I know it's not that kind of a genie. It's the Taco genie. The Taco genie. And if you have a tankless, this is the on demand kind of thing. Uh, you really want to tend to stay away from timers with an on with a with a tankless water heater. And let me ask you guys, and you type in your answer when you think of it, why do you think you want to stay away from a timer control when you have a tankless? Why would you think that? All right. Let's see what you come up with. But yeah, it's it it's it's an on demand. It can either be powered by a manual, a wired push button, a wireless push button, or a motion sensor. All right. So when someone walks in the bathroom, bam, it it, it if it's a sensor, it senses you're in there, it's gonna turn the pump on because it figures you're gonna be using the water at some point. Okay. Uh yeah, Jimmy DePalmi, you got it. You void the warranty of the tankless, right? Uh the burner won't get activated, or if it does get activated, it'll short cycle like crazy. And you're going to kill that thing in in relatively short order. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, I do have a dog. Did she bark? <laughs> I can't get through a webinar without the dog barking. So again, it's push button or motion sensor to start. And what it does is it gives you immediate delivery. You're going to see this as a larger circulator, a 008 or even a 0011. Again, the the goal here is to is to evacuate that hot water line of cold or tepid water as quickly as possible and get that hot water to that fixture within 20 seconds all right so so it's a push button you press the button you you go per, you go you know do something and then bam then you open up the you open up the faucet and your hot water's right there to make it as instantaneous as it can be so you need a high powered high head pump to evacuate that line of colder tepid water as quickly as possible um compared to a, a timer pump if a timer we have a timer on the pump or a smart plug or something like that, time's kind of your ally. And you can actually really get down to a small circulator. Time's on your side. It doesn't have to be as instantaneous. So you take, you make use of that time. So the Genie gives you immediate delivery. All right, immediate delivery. And this is the sanctioned uh, research uh, uh, strategy for tankless water heaters because you're not run you know you're running that water heater but you're running that water heater with the knowledge that it, that a hot water use is imminent you're going to be using hot water almost immediately so that's okay it's okay to work at it that way and and the the, the water heater manufacturers actually prefer that all righty that is the quick primer on on all the different types of domestic hot water uh recirculation and now we're going to go to Murder Hornet number two. Uh, Mr. Mayo, are you ready to take the con? And four, good buddy. All righty, the con is now yours. Okay, uh, uh, were there handouts? Were you able to put the link on oh. there and stuff I sent you? Oh, gosh. Why don't you talk? <laughs> Let me do that. I'm going to go do that right now. Hold <laughs> on a second. Me... Okay, can everybody see my screen? I would imagine. Dave, give me. You got to share your screen. Oh yes, show your screen. There Can you go. go. Okay, there he is. Yay. Let me shrink this down. All right, I'm gonna get those things in there. Hold on. Get those things in there. I'm just gonna show you, uh, folks, a couple um, of things, uh, some handouts that you're gonna get. He's gonna put them on there for you. But um, just understand that we have issues, and uh, there's one question that I'd like to cover. Maybe Dave, you answered it already. Uh, but there was a question about, well, should I use copper? Or should I use PEX, right? And who, which one has less problems, et cetera? Hey, they both got problems. I think John made that pretty clear. It has to do with three or four contributing factors. And if, uh, you know, perfect storm scenario, you'll have problems with flexible piping systems and you'll have uh, trouble with hard pipe as well. So 
Anyway, you're going to get a copy of this, and this is uh, the Velox, uh, velocity maximum chart. Just kind of let you look uh, if you don't want to exceed two feet per second or three feet per second on coppers. Copper kind of gives you a little range where the flexible piping systems just say, hey, don't exceed two feet per second. So what we're doing is most people don't have the velocity memorized. So what we did is just put it in a column to say, okay, here's your GPM maximum. For instance, if I had a three-quarter inch PEX, SDR9 PEX return line, I should keep that around two gallons a minute, right? So anyway, just some quick reference things for you there as well. Uh, you've got a handout that'll give you gallons per foot, or you folks that want liters, we've got that in there as well, liters per meter. So you'll get a handout um, uh, of that. And then you're going to get, and this is what I want to encourage you to actually play with, okay? This is the Domestic Hot Water Research uh, Worksheet. And this worksheet is a manual way of getting your head around what it takes to actually do a design, okay? And we've got some job information up front. We've got some check boxes that apply. Let's give you a little background. I, I made this up just for the sake that if somebody were to get a hold of me, they said, hey, Rick, I need help, uh, uh, you know, uh, making sure this system's going to be right. Well, I'd say, okay, I need a bunch of information in order to help you with that. And so that's all this is. It's just a form so I could gather information of what the job uh, actually has on it and what type of piping material, what piping scheme it is. Some of this doesn't apply if it's, if it's a tank style. It doesn't really matter if it's gas-fired or electric or indirect. It does matter if it's tankless, you know, some of this stuff applies. But what we get into here is we put in a total lineal footage of the supply portion of the system, and this highlighted area is your dedicated return line, okay? So we put the information in there, total runs, then we calculate out how many gallons we have in it, right? And we bring that down here on the supply side only. Then we look at, uh, based on how much GPM we're actually running through the system, then we start calculating what the estimated pressure drop is for those runs. And we work our way down through this thing. And it, it's a handy little thing, uh, a form that gives you a good uh, idea of what it actually takes to do the design correctly. Now, some people would say, oh my God, I don't wanna have to do that but I, I would encourage you to practice, okay? You'll get a copy of this, and if you need help, just get a hold of any of us three, or uh, actually many of our reps have actually already set through this training, and they can help you with this form as well. But uh, um, that gets us that far. Now let's, um, let's go into showing you a little treat here. Hopefully I can go back and repopulate this. Okay. So once you get the worksheet figured out, and I know I'm, it's kind of a tongue in cheek here because most people want the path of least resistance, but here, uh, look here, folks, this is the DHWR, which is Domestic Hot Water Research Size Right Circulator Sizing Tool. This is a little app that Taco has made for you to make your, yeah, come on, God, John, give me that normal. Ah. Uh, that's my, what? That's, That's my, my favorite. favorite. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, if you only <laughs> understood what it sounds like in my ears right now, okay? Uh, okay, so folks, uh, check it out, right? Uh, it's got a description of everything about, you know, what it is, what it can do. This will first show up. Uh, I choose to hide the description right now. Let's just walk you through a quick little design to show you how fast it can be. Again, I want you to do the worksheet first so you get your head around where a lot of this information comes from. So, uh, is there an existing or will there be a domestic hot water recirculation line installed? Of course, in this case, remember, it could be yes or no, as we've talked about two different type of crossover devices, right? So, let's just say yes for simplicity. Let's go in here. Once we do that, there actually it actually starts changing some things within the calculation. When I go here to the water heater type, you get a drop down. It can either be a tank style, it could be a tankless, or it could be you folks in the Northeast that are still using coils, tankless coils that are in boilers. It could be something like that. So let's go with a simplistic tank style application. Then it starts asking you a question. Well, which layout style do you have? Is it trunk and branch with a recirc or is it a full size loop? Okay. For simplicity, we're going to stay with something you've already seen. If you're unsure of some of these descriptions, we put that same little picture in there 
that you can click on and take a look at to say, okay, yeah, trunk and branch with recirculation. That uh, orange line is uh, uh, my recirculation line. So it just kind of gives you an idea of what we mean by our description, okay? Then we're over here. Now, notice this. We got the supply pipe material, copper type M, with a choice of type L, uh, CPVC copper tube size, and PEX SDR9. So those would be your choices of supply material. And most people would say, well, the supply and return is going to be all the same. But no, contraire. We got plenty of old houses that are plumbed in copper. Somebody went in and cut in a dedicated return line in PEX. So we could go down there and do something like that if we wanted to. So just understand why there's two different uh, material there or sections for uh, materials. Notice we've got a clicker here. There's people that don't care anything about pressure drop. They just want us to spit out a, a pump suggestion. So again, that's for those. And then if you do care about the numbers, then you just put the show details and you click that in there. Uh, give me some feedback. Is anybody liking what they see so far other than John and Dave? What? My comments don't matter. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but I can't see their questions and I can't hear them. So I'm giving a little time for feedback. Are you guys, uh, you like what you see? I so don't know. far, so good. Yes. All right. So Rick, I'm just going to, I'm going to put Rich a, McGrath is saying it's his, it's his favorite also. Oh, Rich. I love it. So 50 foot of one inch. I'm just putting a hypothetical in here. I've run a bunch of times. There's some three quarter inch pipe and I've got 70 foot of three quarter inch pipe in there. Uh, I've got a little bit of half inch pipe down toward the end. Let's say that's 10 foot. Okay. Now notice I've got some one inch, some three quarter. That's the supply portion out to the last fixture. That's everything that would be considered the supply part of the, uh, part of the system. Then notice here, there's no pressure drop data, right? We haven't done anything because we haven't given it a GPM. That's one thing that we're going to do with this app that because this is this size right circulator tool is is, is a simplified app. So it's going to make a it's going to make a selection for you. It's going to make your job even easier. And it's going to cover you from some of the things John mentioned already as it relates to problems with velocity erosion and such. Notice what happens when I go over here and I click on the return side and I grab that. Somebody had already installed half inch pipe and it's a total of 130 foot long. OK, all I did here is take this 130 and match these numbers added together. So we got 130 out. We've got 130 back. Okay, so notice now that's populated all my pressure drop information. Pretty handy and pretty fast, right? And if you look down here, it's actually given us a GPM and it's given us a feed ahead already. We already have enough information to size the pump, okay? But we also gave you the ability to go in and do some customizing as well. We are going to put a default in there. Now I'm saying this a default in there that's totally overridable. You can do anything you want to this. We're going to say, we just throw in a number out there. You got to remember when you're using valve and fitting factors, that is a WAG. Now, you guys can fill in the blanks of what a WAG is, okay? But since it's a WAG, you can put any number you want in there, but let's get into reality. So based on my experience, I might do something in the neighborhood of maybe 25 uh, percent for a uh, copper application as I've shown you up here. I might make that a little bit more for uh, a, a standard crimp fitting, etc. So you guys, you'll have to get some information on your own or just use our defaults, okay, if you're unsure. Now in that particular case I showed you, we had a mixing valve in there. So I'm going to go ahead and go yes. And that particular mixing valve had a CV of 1.8. So it does that calculation for you as well. OK, now you can override this and make that CV, whatever the valve that you're going to use is, and it'll do the calculation for you. But notice what I have. I have GPM and feet of head. Guess what I've got? I've got everything I need to actually size this pump. We're going to go one better and we're going to go into the search menu. I'm going to reach down here. John was telling you I spent quite a bit of time on the Smart Plus E. So let's go ahead and click on that. Let's go ahead and just kind of see where that falls in the circulator performance curve. Okay, so I'm going to click on this, blow that up, and lo and behold, Ooh. okay, there's 1.6 at a little that. over 10 foot. There's my operating point. We even have room to go up. We have lots of room to go down. 
let me tell you folks, yes, in this app and in this selection software, there's fudge factor, okay? So just, again, just for safety's sake, let's make sure we're in a good spot on the pump and that we have room to go up and we have room to go down, which with this particular circulator, we absolutely do, okay? Here's what else we can do. What if we went into print and said, I like that, I'm just gonna, I want a submittal data on this thing. So that's my domestic hot water circulator tag one. Uh, there's the actual part number. It's a variable speed, manual setting. It's actually um, uh, about 13 foot ahead and about, uh, what is it in GPM? Think back, the uh, 1311, I think, is what it ends up being because that number actually means something to us. Approximately 12 foot ahead, approximately 12 foot of uh, GPM, excuse me, 12 GPM. And then the suffix, just, is just to help you order the thing and get it right, okay? Uh, the job, I'll do simple stuff that I've already put in there, engineer information in there for sure, plumbing company, and of course, our reps are the best, right? <laughs> and so when we get when we get in there, we go uh, create the PDF. Now, this is where it really gets sweet, right? We have a job-specific submittal data that gives you all the information you need to get that ordered right, to double-check your numbers, based on your design criteria, look at that, man. That's, uh, it doesn't get any better than that. So understand that that's where it's going. And of course, you've got a blow up of your uh, performance curve as well uh, on that. So um, anyway, um, that's, uh, that's where this is at right now. Uh, this Takeo uh, Comfort Solutions, trying to make your life a lot simpler. So I, I, uh, I, I, I notice- Wow. <laughs> uh, notice that we'll give you choices here that seem to be right. We even got a 0012 in there. Uh, that's a big pump, and most people would know. Most people are going to look at the pricing, right? Uh, and this is We've got this set up to give you the high efficiency ECM product first, and then go to standard efficiency and kind of work your way from the one that m most closely matches on up to the ones that are kind of out there on the fringe. So um, always take time. If we put a disclaimer in there, I'm not going to take the time to read it, but you folks are, uh, will have a link for that, and you'll be able to, to look at that as well. The, another thing I want to mention, John, hey, is that- Hey, Rick, can, can I interrupt you real quick? Sure, absolutely. All of the handouts have been uploaded, all four of them. So there's four handouts in your handout section right. on your- on your toolbar, on your control panel. So you can go ahead and download all of the charts that uh, Rick was talking about earlier, as well as a Word document that has a link to this site for you. So oh, just want to get cool. that out there. They're all there and ready for you. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's pull this back up, uh, get that out of the way. Uh, I want to quit sharing my screen. So stop showing screen, that should be good. You should have control again, John, I think. Maybe, I don't know. I can take that back. All right, show my screen. And then you should see my screen somewhere here. Here we go. Are you seeing my screen? There it is. It is, it's there. there it's a it beauty is. of a thing. It's a beauty of a thing. So let's get that trivia answer. So as of right now, no more answers. The trivia answer is Italy, my homeland, the place of my people. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's, we have a circulator manufacturing facility up in northern Italy. Um, they were they were shut down. They were almost at ground zero of the, the COVID-19 outbreak, but they've been back up and open for a bit now. So things are things are looking very very good over there. Uh, but uh, yep, we have we also have a manufacturing facility in Vietnam where they, we have a stainless steel foundry there. We make really high grade stainless steel volutes and components. Um, we have our two in, our, uh, we have a, a, a center in Switzerland and we have other offices throughout Europe. And then we have other, we have uh, other manufacturing facilities or assembly facilities for our vertical turbine pumps in Nashville. We have one in Texas and we have one in California. So those are all, those are all spread out all over the country as well. So just so you know, so that's all good. That's all good. Stuff. good. Yeah. Lots of cool. Questions. Um, a lot of questions coming in, but, but just before we go there, I just want to know school's out, man. You guys <laughs> did it. You did it. Ten weeks. Can you believe we've been doing this for ten weeks? So this begins. It's April, right? So all, or May. We started in May. No, April. Yeah, we started in April. We had 
April, May, and now two in June. So this has been this has been great. So good job, Murder Hornets. You guys rock. It's been a, it's been a heck of a run. And we're gonna get to all your questions here. And again, as we said, we're gonna stay on until the last man standing is not gonna be is gonna gonna oh. gonna gonna sit down. We're not gonna uh, get to the questions yet. We gotta give something away. Oh, geez, Dave, you're right. From and, last and, week. Right. We got to give away our prize from last week before we get to the questions. Uh, also, just so you know this, right. you want uh, you want some uh, um, stickers, just reach out to Dave at Takeo Training on Instagram, and uh, Dave will make sure you get some stickers. He, and he's much better at getting stickers out if you're not Rick Mayo. <laughs> he'll get you. Get you. <laughs> I got my stickers, Dave. You'll get your I stickers good. out right away if your name oh, is Oh, we found Rick what Mayo. happened with Rick. Yeah, I I typoed his uh, his stickers went to about um, seventy two blocks away from him. Yeah, who knows? Oh, yeah. They're wondering what the heck are these. <laughs> and then and then and then Zv, uh, uh, another guy that's online here. I sent out uh, a, a blank envelope to him, empty. There was nothing in it. <laughs> <laughs> but I've taken hey, that, that's so. got a bad connotation, man. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was just filling out a bunch of envelopes one night and I put nothing inside of it. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> hey, one thing Anyways. to bring up, though. Um, yes. When we were talking about uh, manufacturing facilities and stuff, let's not forget our frozen chosen brethren uh, just north of us, right? They manufacture pumps in Canada all day long. So. That's right. Hey? That's right. That is correct. That's, that's correct. right. That's right. So last week, you got to take over. I, I made you the presenter, Dave. You got to show your screen. I will do that in a second. But la I just oh, figured I'd, I'd tee it up for a second, too. But sorry, last week we had the question <laughs> of uh, of uh, of Takeo being a third generation company, third generation owner and the fourth generation working there. And and Johnny White's two sons uh, was the question was who were th what were their names? And yes, the two Utes counted, Dan. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the two Utes. I love the two Utes. The two Utes. The Utes. And uh, so, yes, the, the answer was uh, John the Third and Ben White. And uh, so I do have those names here. So let me uh, put that up on the screen here a second. Hang on. Let me get rid of that. And uh, darn it. I already let me share the screen. Oh, we see your questions coming in. This is terrific. We will get to each one of them. All right. Hang on a second. I darn it. It's not showing me. Oh, there we go. This is what I wanted to see. Let me close that and let me do a spin and let's see who is going to be the winner of a iVal. And it looks like it's going to be Kirk. All right, Good Kirk. Job, Kirk. Hey, Kirk. Woo! Kirk, Kirk I will. If you are online tonight, I will contact you shortly, and we will, or, or myself or Ken Watson will contact you shortly, and uh, via email to find a, a shipping address for you. So, congratulations, buddy. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Thanks for the answer. There's a round of applause. Very good. Very good. <laughs> All righty. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Let me so pull those questions we, back up. We, we can get to we can get to some questions. I've got one sitting me or staring at me in the face here. Is there any issue using a, a hot link crossover valve at the farthest fixture if that farthest fixture happens to be a washing machine? And the answer there, of course, is no. No doesn't problem know, at all. Doesn't it's, know what remember, machine. It, 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 yeah, it's going to be it's going to be priming that hot water line all the way around. All right, it's going to be priming that thing all the way around. So no, there's no 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 problems there at all. Uh, in fact, if you act, you can actually put up to six hot link valves on one 006 or 006E3 circulator. Okay, up to six of them in various parts of the house. So if you like had a house that you had a wing going off this way with a bath with some hot water fixture groups and a wing going off this way with hot water fixture groups and just had one pump in the middle, you could put you could put uh, multiple uh, uh, hot link valves out there, all right, up to six to 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 make sure you get hot water recirculation in all spots. So yeah, that that's something you can do. And yeah, it doesn't matter if that farthest fixture is in fact a washing machine. So cool, good question, very good question. Now the way I look at it too is I also look at where you put that valve is probably a little more critical, as in. Who pays the bills in the house and who wants the hot water the most? <laughs> That's where I look at it. So I 
uh, if you're going to put more than one valve in the house, you look at dropping one into the master bathroom and a second one in the kitchen. Those are the two fixtures that I find the most important in it, in any structure. Make sure those people are happy. So if you're going to put two valves in, those are the two you put it in. Definitely. Very good. Very good. All righty. So a lot of questions have come in here. Um, one was, uh, oh, can I access a recording of the webinar? Yep. You will be get everybody's going to be getting a follow-up email. All right. Tomorrow. And in that e follow-up email will be a link to the recording. And then you'll also be able to view it on uh, Mechanical Hub's YouTube page, on Taco's YouTube page. And we've got something else in the works as well that we'll, we're, we're working on here. So you might have some other ideas, some other sources. Um, cool. Let's go back here and take a look here. Would it, will, will there be a 0018 stainless steel pump coming out so you can look inside the pipe to see proper flow and head and then install the 006 E3 and set the proper setting? Gosh, what a good idea. <laughs> what a good idea. Yeah, man, what a great idea. Gosh, why didn't we think of that? Yes, yes, you, 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 be patient. Yes, of course it will be. It's coming. All right. That was such a good question that Jeff actually asked it twice. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the second time, yes, again. All right, let's put it that way. <laughs> well, he's got a point there. So if you noticed, one of the things um, that came up on the – uh, the worksheet that will come up on the worksheet and came up on the app is what is the GPM that will keep you just below that maximum velocity limitation? So, hell, if we know what the GPM is and we know what not to exceed and we have a circulator that tells us what the GPM is and is accurate, then guess what we can do in the fixed speed mode? We can just turn it down until we get to the GPM we want. Because in the world of Taco, we don't believe in using these automatic modes for domestic hot water. Those modes weren't designed for domestic hot water. They don't work well in that. In fact, they work in the wrong way, almost backwards. So that's another one of those, um, I don't know, very good marketing ploys that we've uh, seen by some of our competitors. So in the world of Taco, we turn a circulator on and then we turn it off. We turn it on and we turn it off. It doesn't need to change its speed while it's running. So anyway, hopefully you, uh, you, you get what we're, where we're going with that. So if we can give you a circulator, stainless steel, that gives you GPM settings, we, we've got everything pretty much as good as it can possibly get. And you're going to see it. There you go. There you yep. go. I do want to bring up another point to that worksheet and, and those uh, flows charts that Rick was also putting together. That's showing maximum flow. Right. So you right. could do less. Mm -hmm. So when you're designing a system and you've got the numbers that you're plugging in there and all of a sudden the head loss goes skyrocketing way outside the realm of circulators that don't need a V8 connected to it in order to make it spin. <laughs> drop the flow rate so your head loss comes down and now you can select a circulator now understand you know when you when you really dive into those worksheets you'll also see the total gallonage that's in the system itself and so you'll also understand how much water you need to evacuate out in order to make it work and make sure you know the understandings of what the system does for you so you can always lower that gpm and say hey you know what it might this system now has three gallons in there that I need to evacuate, so it's going to take some time to make sure I move it all. So um, the best thing about this, uh, the worksheets that Rick has done and the, the app that we have coming out is now we know for sure what the heck we got going on. I, I think as an industry, we've been kind of making this up as we've all gone along, and, and Rick, I, I got to commend you, buddy, for really jumping on board that and and really putting the numbers behind it because uh, there's been a lot of, you know, make it up as you go along over the years with research and kind of make it work and it's okay. But now we've got, now we've got the numbers behind it and, you know, you know, us, it's always do the math, you know, that's right. Math, never that's be right. wrong. Yep. Got a couple of really interesting questions here. Um, given that we have different water needs, uh, weekdays versus weekends, does the smart plug have a seven day memory? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, which I, I, I try to express that it, it learns Monday, then it does Tuesday, then it does Wednesday. So it's constantly relearning, but it has a full seven day schedule. 
but it's not fixed. Like I said, it's re it relearned. So if you have this Sunday schedule and the next day it's a little, next Sunday it's a little different, it'll give you a new Sunday schedule. It'll constantly re relearn and reevaluate with your, with your changing needs. So it's not, once it learns, it stays there. No, that's not how it works. It's constantly reevaluating and relearning. So uh, the other question that came in a little later was, you know, the algorithms were toast the first two weeks of lockdown. Well, yeah, they were, but, but, they, but they're not static. Okay, they'll relearn and relearn and relearn and relearn. And if you happen to have that kind of a structure or uh, uh, like a building or that kind of a customer with that kind of lifestyle where they really have no fixed hot water usage patterns, or they're one of those, they're on the high end of the I don't give a darn that we talked about earlier. You just slap that sucker into pulse mode, all right? And it's going to be five, go five minutes on, 10 minutes off, 24-7 every day of the year. And that way, it just simply adapts. And, and that's, a, that's another alternative that you have, okay? That's, yeah, that's what I got in my house. So I put, the, I put the smart plug in. I was one of the beta testers way back when, and I put it in my house. And, but the only person that has a schedule in my house is me. And I Why live I on the road. Surprised? Why yeah, am I not surprised? I, I live on the road too. So, you know, my <laughs> wife is a stay at home. My in laws live with me. The kids between sports and school, who knows when the water's being used. So, I put mine in the pulse mode. It didn't have anything to learn, it was all over the place. So, so I use mine in the pulse mode. And so, interesting, I was being a little bit of a nut and I, I took my smart plug and I put a regular wall timer behind that to shut the power down in the middle of the night because i know there was no usage after midnight mm -hmm. you know between midnight and six o'clock in the morning and yeah, that's, that's pretty smart but literally two days later two days later my mother-in-law calls me up and says you know i went to go take a shower the other night at 12 30 and i had to wait for the hot water i think you gotta go look at something i'm like you gotta be kidding me i took that timer out and threw it away yeah. might as well let it spin yeah, yeah, exactly. I was just like, all right, I don't need that phone call. Yeah, oh, there I you couldn't go. believe that happened. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's another question about how does the smart plug know to put the circulator on? I, I, I'm presuming you're not talking about, uh, and this this question came from Daniel. I'm, you're not talking about the internal circuitry. It's just simply, it's a go between between you know the power in the outlet and the the cord of the circulator. So when it's when the internal brain says click it it just it just makes the connection and when it's a stop it's it, it stops it's a relay if you want an explanation of the algorithm you're, you're talking to the wrong three guys i mean you know these two might be able to help you out but uh, it's it's math and algorithms we'll put it that way and a solid state relay built inside that box so yeah that's all yep there you go very good very but that's again it learns and then it replicates and relearns and re-replicates i mean that's maybe the best way to put it I got All an answer right. for uh, David Kuzma. Okay. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, actually, uh, David, we actually started with a full-blown, you know, well, up to like three-inch pipe version of this app. Uh, but we were directed to not spend our time on that right away and to give a simple residential version. So just to clarify, the version I showed you only goes up to one inch. And eventually we'll have a, a more advanced version of the app that will be able to be used on some commercial applications not every commercial application but uh quite a few because that's what we had in mind when we first started it as john and david both said residentially speaking most people just throw a pump in there and walk away from it they don't think about sizing or anything uh, and it tends to work but there are ramifications john's already brought those up but when we get to commercial, people are doing some things really wrong and <laughs> we're trying to get that fixed. And so that's where this app started. Uh, it's where the spreadsheet, that's where that worksheet started. You know, worksheet was a spreadsheet. Now it's an app kind of thing. Um, so yes, to answer your question, David, there will be a larger version coming out. I can't give you a date at this point in time. Um, resources are being pulled away and anyway, uh, that so, eventually yeah. we'll be able to do something uh, on light commercial applications. So, so what yeah, I want to show you guys real quick, uh, when Rick talks about the app, here's the Takeo app. It's not going to be a standalone Takeo app that you're going to download. So, but we have our own Takeo app, and what you see here 
is a bunch of different links on there. It's going to be a web app, as we call it. So yep. right next to what you'll see on the screen here, that spot right there will probably be where we'll see the DHWR size right program. We'll click right there and go to a link that will optimize. So like I said, we're still in some final development of that uh, of that app, of that website that uh, – that Rick is working on. So, um, but you got you guys are getting it ahead of everybody yes. else. That's right. You, you should feel privileged to take go after dark. <laughs> no, get you were take get, go after use it, mess around with it, play with it. If you find anything whatsoever, please give us a call. Uh, if it's not doing what you want it to do, or if you think of something that's not happening properly, so let us know on that. Um, so it is it is pretty cool right now. Um, like I said before. Got a question from Peter Kupchik. Where do I go to quickly find your pump curves for all of your double O line and the double O E line? Uh, Takeocomfort.com. Um, everybody's website's a little different, and sometimes some people find ours very easy to navigate. You just got to look up for your pro look up product. Uh, use the search function. You know, if you use the search function and just you know you know the double O double O circulators, you'll get to the double O circulators, and you'll have submittal sheets and lists for all of the different curves. Uh, ECM products, same thing. If you look those up, you'll find all of the uh, pump curves for the for the double OE line as well. So um, that might be the easiest and quickest way. Just go to the search function, type in what you're looking for, and you'll and it'll it'll get you there, uh, get you there pretty quickly. Here's how what I would suggest too: try to hook up with your local rep, get yourself a catalog, because we've yeah. got the whole back section of it where we show oh all of them right there on the pages. So get your get your hands get your on a catalog one of these, from your baby. Reps. Yeah. We don't have that on the website. I was looking for it just now. I, don't, I see that we don't have it up there somewhere. Um, so hook up with your local rep and get yourself a hard copy. He may also have a PDF version of that too. Um, but that's I was just about to uh, to answer that question there, Peter. So uh, very good. So yeah, Excellent. there you go. What, what does that look like again there, Rick? Throw, let me show that one more time. Sure. For you, John, I'll do it. Okay, because you're the you boss. Are man. There you go. Get yourself one of them. All right, for the residential catalogs, got all the plumbing products and the heating products. So that that may be the best uh, the best uh, handy device that you have. Very good. Here's one from, uh, let's uh, see. Uh, Go Borenstein, right? Uh, what stops the pump when in a retrofit application the bypass valve closes? Well, nothing. Uh, let's say, for instance, give you a scenario. Say the pump comes on and runs through the crossover valve for two minutes. And then in two minutes time, the the unit is nice and warm. It feels that temperature and changes position and shuts off. The pump will remember, it'll continue to run for the remaining three minutes and it doesn't hurt anything. That pump's a real little pump. It can deadhead for three minutes and we have no issue. We still give you a full warranty. There's no no problems with that. We've been doing that for well over five years and no issues so far. So hopefully that answers that question. And deadheading pumps is a problem with big pumps. Little right. pumps, yeah. even a even a non-ECM pump, even a you know standard efficiency little pump, sure. you can deadhead those things for a while. It's not the, it's not going to kill it. It's not the best thing in the world for it, but it's not a, it's not fatal. You 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 yeah. really people get wrapped up about deadheading, and you really want to be concerned about you know non-stop deadheading for several months with little pumps. Uh, big pumps, you don't want to deadhead them at all if you can all avoid it. So that's kind of that's kind of way the, the way you want to look at it that way. So yeah, you put, not, you put this little thing in there. I'm not going to worry about it deadheading itself. And you'd yeah. make it ECM. That's the idea of doing the design for it too. You know, so you you dial it down to the speed that you need it to run at. So when it's deadheading and it's ECM at that, you're gonna you're gonna be really beneficial there. So that's a that's a really big thing about it, definitely. Here's an interesting question. Uh, is it better to be a lower GPM with a tankless water heater or is it better to have a higher GPM so it does not short cycle? Well, again, the pump is just merely turning that thing on so we can prime that, you know, again, when we're talking about, when we're talking about the, uh, the, the, the Genie, all right, that's gonna be a blaster of a pump. So it's gonna be a good amount of flow and a good amount of head pressure differential. All we're trying to do is get the hot water to that to, to wherever that that crossover pump might happen to be as quickly as we can, or to wherever if it's if it's actually piped in in a recirc with a recirc line, you can still use the genie with a recirc line. We just want to get that hot water line filled up as quickly as we can, and then the pump shuts off, and then nature takes over. Nature, you know, 
Yeah, then you open up a faucet and then 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 the pump's just doing whatever it's going to do. Remember, we got to make sure we understand with domestic hot water recirculation. It's not the way water gets from the water heater to the to the fixture. That's done by street pressure. That's that's nature. That's just the way it's always been done. The only thing domestic hot water recirculation is doing is, is shortening up the delivery time, meaning if it's on a timer, it's going to keep that water prime. So when you do turn the faucet on, it's going to be there. We're not, we don't need GPM to deliver water. We don't need to, to, to deliver the, the requirements of the fixture units. We don't have to do any of that. That's all done by nature. All this is doing is keeping that hot water line primed. In the case of a genie, what we're trying to do is activate the water heater and get the get that hot water to that farthest fixture in in 20 seconds or thereabouts, so that when you turn on the faucet, bada bing, you've got water right there. You're not wasting. You know. Can waiting I add to, to that? Absolutely. I I think what he was worried about is the cycling as well, right? So mm -hmm. keep in mind that the manufacturer of the tankless will give you a minimum flow rate that it takes to fire it. Their turn down ratio, remember we talked about this in a couple of sessions before, they're set up to keep the flame low enough under those low flow conditions so that it's not cycling. So that's purely up to the manufacturer of the, the unit that you're buying. But if they tell you that you need a half a GPM to fire that unit, then their flame turndown ratio has the ability to get low enough so that it doesn't cycle on and off. You're, you're correct. That would kill something if, if that happened. So it doesn't really matter. It's not really – I don't think – you have to run it faster to not fast cycle it. I think the manufacturers have a turndown ratio that keeps the flame low enough so that even at their minimum flow rates, everything's taken care of. And again, we might have some tankless manufacturers uh, here on tonight that can confirm that or dispel it. So. Yeah, they're also concerned with the heat exchanger too. So, so much heat going into the, the beginning part of the heat exchanger and not enough high flow rate to to pull it away from the beginning it gets too hot too early so i think that's also some of the other concerns they have when we go too low of a flow through the heat exchanger so those are other you know so it's going to be dependent upon the manufacturer too here's a question from mike lampkin what is the best way to get in touch with you three amigos i can't speak for the other two guys the best way to get a hold of me would be to uh you know put a self-addressed stamped envelope <laughs> Tape it to the back of a Lavaza latte machine, package it up, and ship it to my house in Exeter, New Hampshire, and I'll write you back. All right. But it's a Lavaza latte espresso machine. All right. Just tape your envelope right to the back of that. I'll find it. Don't worry. And ship it to me, and I'll get back. <laughs> Johnny, what's that worth? What's what worth? That machine. I, it, well, it, it, it might, it might it, be worth an awful lot to Mike if he really needs some help. It, it's worth it sounds like bribery to me. <laughs> sounds like it's worth a conversation. Wait a minute, wait a minute. How long have we been known each other? You know, bribery works great with me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I'm surprisingly affordable. <laughs> hey, uh, our, our uh, Taco addresses are real easy. Uh, first three letters of the first name, first three letters of the second name, followed by at TacoComfort.com. Yeah, so J-O-H-B-A-R at TacoComfort.com. R-I-C-M-A-Y-M-O-U-S-E. No, leave the mouse off. <laughs> D-O-C-E-V-I at TacoComfort. <laughs> I didn't Evil. get that one. I knew it was wrong. <laughs> Dave, 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 Dave. I know, have I a know. long talk when we're done here. <laughs> I um, I do have to give a, a, a comment here from or a question actually uh, from our first, I believe our furthest listener. Yeah. From Australia. Oh. So, yeah. so John Lean from Australia was asking about the smart plug if it's available in 230. Uh, unfortunately, Bud, it's not. It's it's only 120 volt. It is up to a six amp rating that these plugs can handle. Um, so, but it is uh, it is only for a 120 volt. So, sorry, Bud, uh, we sorry have it available for you guys out that way. But we'll see. Who knows? Who knows? As these things are growing in popularity, you never know the direction these are going to take. You can't the guys in Australia. You can't say sorry about that, Bub. It's sorry about that, mate. Mate, mate. Sorry. Mate. There you go. <laughs> Get it right. Get it right. Now I tried somebody from 
Oh, what are you, sorry, go ahead. Somebody from Medellin, Colombia. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you for a great webinar. Stay safe and healthy. You too, Daniel Hernandez. All right, good. thank you, Daniel. Here's one from Adam Pope. I tried sizing a recirc pump and was confused about head. No domestic recirc pumps have much head. Does head matter when sizing these types of pumps? This is coming from sizing one at a five-story building. Closed uh -huh. loop. Uh, Adam, it's a closed loop. Remember, it's a closed loop. Height doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how high it is. It doesn't matter. It's not a it's not a well pump. It's not a booster pump. It's not a pump at all. It's a circulator. So we have a closed loop. We don't have to push the water up to the fifth floor because if it's a recirc line, don't we have the same amount of water coming back down the other side, right? So we don't have to pressurize anything. We don't have to worry about that. All we need is to keep that hot water line primed. So in a lot of cases, it's just, well, not a lot of cases, in every, it's the friction loss of the piping at the flow rate we determined that we need based on what Rick showed you. Very so good. yeah, don't worry about the height of the building. Don't worry about the height. It's a closed loop. Think of the, the circulator as the motor on a Ferris wheel. It's just making the thing go round and round. It's not lifting anybody up. You got somebody on the other cart on the other side going back down. So yeah, low head, it, you, you'd be surprised You'll be surprised how small of a pump you can get away with, even in commercial applications. And again, the flow rate doesn't have to meet the, we, Rick and I talked about this earlier this afternoon. The flow, we've had engineers insist that the flow rate provided by the circ, the recirc pump had to be big enough to deliver the flow rate to all of the fixtures, which is absurd. No, 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 no. Because what if you took the, that means if you took the pump out, you wouldn't get hot water anywhere. No, that's the street pressure and the pipe sizing and all that. That's what does it. All we're doing is, let's say it together, okay? We're keeping the hot water line primed with hot water. That's all we're doing. That's the responsibility, yeah. Yep. Along with that, John, uh, Zvi has another uh, follow-up that that is, uh, I want to clarify, okay? He's got a good point here. He's talking about, if we put that little pump volute in line on a one inch or maybe even an inch and a quarter line going out, doesn't that cause restriction? It absolutely does. We have mm -hmm. several different drawings that show you where you can put the pump on the supply out, like a lot of the simple little three quarter inch residential applications. But we also show the circulator on the return back at the bottom of a tankless style unit. So then then we would not interfere at all with the flow going out to the fixture. So it'll be up to you from a local code perspective. There's areas uh, out west where I'm at that they don't let you use that drain to bring the water in the bottom of the tank. And there's various reasons they state for that. So it, again, it's up to your local codes, but just, um, uh, look at the alternative piping schemes that we give you. Um, there's also another handout we could do later at another time or something that is a colored depiction of all the black and white drawings that pretty much, uh, you know, there's, I think there's like 11 pages to a little uh, handout that I've been using out West. Uh, you guys, wherever you're at are welcome to it. If you want a copy of it, you know what my email address is, send it to me. Uh, give me a request. I'll send you something. Very good, very good. All righty, is a recirc pump mandatory depending upon local codes? Can I install a recirc pump on shorter distance? Absolutely, yeah, you can. And it, codes are gonna be different no matter where you go. I mean, I, I remember when I was working, you know, when I was working with the tools with my dad, you had a, there, there was a recirc code in the state of Massachusetts. If you were, if the farthest fixture was I think 100 feet away or 75 feet away, you had to install a recirc line. Nobody did. And no inspector, very, very, very few inspectors even bothered to enforce it, but it was in the books, all right? So I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be depending upon codes and depending upon inspectors. What we are seeing is in, you get into like in California, what, what's the deal in California? Was, was it tight, not Title IX, was it uh, Title 21? What's the code in California? Title 24. 24. Title 24, there you go. You know, where any new construction, you have to have a recirc line, all right? And you're seeing it in an awful lot of applications anyway. I mean, you, they've been doing recirc in, in, in you know, states where water is, is at a premium forever anyway, even if it hasn't been mandated. But there are plenty of places that mandate it, and there are plenty of places that will 
that will re, that will enforce that code. So yeah, you got you just got to know where you what you're dealing with. And Dave, yeah, you, you, you can put it on a shorter run. There's nothing to stop you. Absolutely. Dave, did you already answer the question from Adam Pope about uh, the small light on the pump? <laughs> I did not. I don't think I got to there yet. Okay, well, Adam, you're you're asking for a light on the pump showing that the flow is made. Uh, our, our pumps, especially that one that I showed you on the on the app on the uh, example, is the 006 E3. It has a built-in LED on it that tells us all kinds of cool things, including what you're looking for. Again, that pump. If the light is in a uh, um, um, operation mode, you know our pump is spinning. You don't need a flow switch to prove that the pump is spinning. So um, that would just be added money. I'm not saying you couldn't do that, but by the time you find an NSF potable water listed flow switch, and just to prove that the pump is on, that uh, that's just adding dollars that, that, that you don't need. Uh, we're pretty much uh, pretty sure that if our light is in the operation mode, our pump is actually moving water. So um, I hope that helps. I hope that answers that question. Very good. Peter Kupchik's asked a couple of questions here, following up about uh, uh, pump curves, uh, not in the paperwork of the of, of certain circulators. And in some circulators now, that it hasn't been included. Uh, our older 00 series pumps are just it's not on there when you look at a 00 like a 0015 e3 or something like that you'll actually see the pump curve printed on the box all right so you've got the you've got or and and definitely in the instruction sheets the older circulators like specifically the 007 it's been around forever um and it's one of those pump curves that you you, you it's kind of hard to explain but it's 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 like it, it's like kleenex you know you kind of know what it does um, I'm not sure if that's the reason why it's not included in the instruction sheets or not. Uh, but some of our pumps do, the newer pumps I definitely do. The older pumps don't, and if you're looking for a reason why, I'm not sure I could give you a good answer. I don't know if either the other guys might have a might have a little bit more insight on that. No, I, I, I don't know why it wouldn't be in there. I think most of our newer product will actually have the circulator curve in there, for sure. So uh, if you want something to just do memory by, a Taco 007 is is actually what we would now refer to as a 1023, and I'll let somebody else explain that to him. <laughs> 10 feet ahead, 23 gallons a minute, baby. Yeah, <laughs> that's a 1023. 1023. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, there could be many many jokes about that, but we're not going to do them. <laughs> I, I want to bring up one other thing about hot water research here. Um, for a lot of us here, you know, we, John and Rick went through how to size, how to design, what to look for, things like that. But I think one of the biggest things that we are missing here, research in the United States is less than 2% of homes. Oh boy. Craziness. The, the huge opportunity that we all have in this field is amazing. When I saw all the answers coming through on people waiting for hot water, and you guys are in the field and you're waiting for it. <laughs> Just think of all the people that don't have it. So the biggest thing I want to bring out there is all you got to do is bring it up to them. Now, this is a point. This is a point in time where you can become a hero to a customer. Because when a customer sees you today, you're there to fix something. You're there to replace something. So they really don't want to see us. When it comes to hot water research, now it's something you're bringing up a problem that they have in their home that they didn't know they had. And all you got to do is present it to them and say, hey, I can get rid of that. Maybe not today because I'm already here doing other stuff and you're going to get a bill at the end of the day. But just remember that I can get rid of that weight for hot water. So that's, a, I think, a, a big thing. And now where we can all of a sudden become a hero to them rather than just another bill. So, and to eliminate that, because we don't know their pain points. We are all going to say sometimes, oh, well, I don't think they're going to pay for that. You don't know that. You really oh, don't, don't want to talk and, to them. Yeah. And don't make that decision for them. You don't, you don't have that right. Right. I remember hearing this from John many, many years ago. Do not become their, your customer's financial advisor. You don't know <laughs> what they will spend money on. All right. You give them the opportunity. If they want to give it to you, you should take it. They might right. take you up on it. 
Yeah. It just yeah. might take you up on it. There you go. Exactly. So I, I, you know, being on the road as much as I am, and when I come home and I come walking into the house wearing a Taco shirt, and my wife is a stay at home and she's involved in so much in the community between Girl Scouts and PTA and this and that and the other thing. There's always some sort of meeting happening in my house. And I walk in the house and they look at my shirt and they're kind of reading the logo and they're looking for the Taco Bell somewhere showing up on there and they're not sure what it means. <laughs> and they ask me what I do and I turn around. And I'm not going to get involved in the heating stuff because for most people that just, you know, boom right over their heads, right? They get bored with it. But then I talk about hot water research and everything starts to perk up just a little bit. Oh, really? Huh? And then inevitably, inevitably it turns to how much? And I said, well, it's different. It depends. There's so many variables, but, and I'm just going to throw out a wild number here, anywhere between say four and $900 for a system installed in your house. Really? That's it is what I hear a lot. Yeah. yeah. That's it. And this is on Long Island. So think about that. Just all you have to do is present it to them. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember we, we, that take a, we did a spot with this old house many years ago. And every time that show gets replayed, we see a little blip in sales. Because this old house has been on for so long, it takes a long time to get their replays done. But you will all of a sudden see a little blip because homeowners realize that they can fix a problem they didn't know they had. So bring it up to them. And, uh, you know, you'd be surprised. You'll be surprised if you're not doing research today. Definitely. And something you pointed out to me, Dave, a few months ago. What have we been hearing from people from that we have to do more now than we've ever thought about doing before over the past several months? Wash, wash them your hands. hands in warm water. Yeah. Wash in warm hands. water. Yeah. Yes. How about washing the hands in hot water and not waiting around? That's always a little something, something there, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, I got a question for the group, and I, it's a little off topic. I know I got a couple of outstanding questions here that I want to get to, but just uh, earlier on in this in the presentation, we mentioned that. Comparing a house built in the 60s to a house built more, more recently, um, the, the house is about, what, 75% bigger. My question is pretty simple. Why are houses 75% bigger? Why are houses bigger today than they were back then? What allowed that to happen? Why did that happen? Let's see what you got here. What do you think? To store more, yeah, no, well, <laughs> that might be a byproduct. When, when you when you have a space, you can fill it. Wealth, is it wealth? I don't know. Yeah, well, no, uh, there's, wealth has absolutely gone point. up. Possibly. They should not be. Economy of scale. Guy's missing it. Guys are missing it. It's, it's, it's construction techniques. Construction, construction techniques. Construction techniques, specifically what it is, Dave, I, I believe this to be true, specifically mm -hmm. what it is. Oh, I know. The yep. advent of PVC and, D, uh, and uh, ABS drain pipe. Because think about back in the 60s, when I was a lad, all right, when I was a lad, what were, what were the, the plumbers installing for drainage waste and vent? Cast, cast iron, cast iron pipe, and uh, and 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 DWV grade copper for venting. That was heavy. It was expensive. You know, if you were pouring lead joints, okay, it was time consuming. All right. Yeah, Grandpa had the had arms the size of my leg. Yeah, that's you know why? Because he was lift, <laughs> lifting them big eight foot sections of cast iron pipe. Yeah. I mean, when I was a kid, this may be this may explain a lot to you two. When I was about eight years old, my job was to melt lead. <laughs> For my dad. That's why you turned out the way you. That's did. why. That's you were you were wondering. That's why. You couldn't. You physically couldn't build a big house because it would have been way too expensive. So that's why you had those houses with the main stack going right up the center of the house, and most of the fixture groups were right off the stack. You know, maybe you had one way off, but most of them were right off the stack. And the the run from the water heater to those fixtures wasn't very long, right? It really, it just wasn't very long, and you didn't have very many of them. So waiting for hot water wasn't really a big deal, all right? As we got to use PVC and ABS, all of a sudden, 
we could put a fixture group way on the far end of a larger home and it wasn't going to cost very much it was going to be really easy to do hell all you need to do drainage back then was a since since that since those days now you don't you don't need lead or anything else all you need is a you know a hand saw a can of glue and a level and a level and who the hell uses a level right i'm kidding i'm kidding kidding all right it's a joke <laughs> But I, I honestly believe that was one of the key contributors to houses getting bigger because they could, you know, it was no longer, it was economically feasible. It was technologically feasible. So that, I believe that to be true. I do. I absolutely do. All right. Here, Peter Kupchik says, I live and work in what's called the Gold Coast of Fairfield County, Connecticut. They still use cast iron pipe for their drops to hold down the sound. Yeah. A lot of houses you absolutely yes. will still do that, you know, to keep because, you know, when somebody flushes something, if you got PVC pipe, you know what's going on. Right. Cast iron, not so much. So in certain homes like that, absolutely. And there right. are parts of I think someone correct me if I'm wrong. I think there are parts of. There are parts of Pennsylvania, which is kind of the wild kingdom of plumbing codes, right? There are parts of Pennsylvania where you are, where, where lead and oakum joints and cast iron actually is still the requirement. You even can't even use PVC or ABS because oh, the inspector has an idea. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we still have that in New York, in New York City. You know, not out here on the island where I am, but in a lot of parts of the city, there's not a lot of plastic being used at all you know, supply or, mm -hmm. or waste. So we're still looking at a lot of cast iron being used out there. Yeah. Or, or in yep. there, you know? Yep. Yeah. And you, you, and you'll have those homes like, you know, I, I think of them, you know, the mansions like the Clampets used to live in, it, it was cost wasn't an issue, you know, they didn't care. So right. yeah, they'll run cast iron everywhere. It doesn't matter. It absolutely doesn't matter. Uh, but you know, the, the, the normal home, right? The median home, which is by definition, the normal home, has gone to 2,400, 2,500 square feet. I'm not talking about mansions. It's nor the normal home you you could buy. Some of those built, you know, over the past you know 20 years, 30 years. The reason it's gotten to grow that much is simply, I believe, has an awful lot to do with the drain pipe. Because plumbing so rules the world. That's right. That's right. And think about what you know, and you think about where they're building houses. You know, you get in the big cities. They're having, you know, major cities. How many how many major housing developments, you know, single family home housing developments have they had in Boston, in New York City, in Chicago proper? Yeah. <laughs> you know, since you know, they, they don't. OK, they just don't. It's, it's, a, it's not even worth discussing. But you get right. into, you know, once you get out into the where the houses were being built in the suburbs, in the Sun Belt now, down in Florida, down in 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 in, in Arizona and New Mexico and in and, and those areas where, where most of the new home construction is being built now or where, you know, just think of the big housing developments of the past 40 years. You know, going back to the mid 70s when we started using PVC, that, that's they were outside of the city and they were able to get bigger because of that. There, that's all I have to say. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah. Adam Pope asks, are there other webinars for commercial buildings for sizing heating pumps that you guys are well, actually for commercial? We're not. Our team is not doing them. We have a commercial team uh, with Brett Zerba and uh, Rich Medeiros, who guys you want. You want to talk about smart these guys these guys are playing you know we're playing we're playing they're playing chess and we're playing Candyland. that's how i feel when i talk to these guys they are smart <laughs> man. you know they, they're really good um and they're they, we, we we do webinars every tuesday we have been doing them every tuesday we're gonna in june in, as june ends we're gonna go back to every other week but they're called Takeo tuesdays and all of those webinars are stored on our website uh, on takeocomfort.com Adam, and you can go back and watch them all. We've got a ton of them on sizing commercial pumps for heating systems for chillers. I mean, there's a there's just a, a million different uh, uh, topics for you to to review. So uh, the way it's been working is uh, since uh, uh, I think it was starting in the end of March, we started doing them every uh, every we started doing one a week just because people were home. Uh, going into July, we're going to do them every other week. So one week will be a, a residentially focused. Two weeks later, it'll be commercial. Two weeks later, it'll be residential, and so on. So that would be a you know go go to our website, look up for look up Takeo Tuesdays, and you'll you'll find them, man. You'll find a ton. Is it possible to have multiple crossover valves at fixtures that are in different branched lines? Many home runs, no loop. Homeowner plumbed. Eek. Um, different brand like home run. Are you talking about home run? Uh, a, a, yeah. a, a home run plumbing system where you just have a straight shot to each fixture from a manifold 
if that's the case, uh, the best way I've ever heard of doing research in a in a in a home run system, and it's hard to do, is just you have to do research through the through the manifold, you know, whether it's a mana block or something like that, and then from there on out, you know, it's it's it, it's whatever's in the line. But if you can keep that the mana block primed with hot water, then then that's about half the battle. I'm not sure if there's another way to do it. Uh, Rick, Dave, have you seen yeah. other op, op, alternatives? The, cro Rick? the crossovers could be put at any of the fixtures, and they don't know. I mean, we've we've tested six, but there's really no reason that you couldn't use more than six. All the crossover valve needs is a pressure differential, which is provided by the circulator. The so if I got a pump on there that'll do it, you know, and it feels a pressure differential between hot and cold at that particular fixture, whether it's across a manifold or, or one of those, you know, home run type uh, applications, it'll work. It has worked. And to the best of my knowledge, there's really not a limiting factor other than the dollars you want to spend on those. So what I would do if you want to experiment is go do a couple of really bad areas and see if they're happy with those and start adding them and you know put six seven eight of them on there uh again with with an appropriately sized circulator which doesn't need to be very big okay mm -hmm. uh so i don't don't get me wrong when i say appropriate sized um uh, i i think you could uh, turn one of those home run systems that they're waiting for water you could turn that to perform better so yeah. So like like I said before, Steve, um, critical areas. Put the valves where it's important to the homeowners. Laundry room doesn't care about waiting for hot water. All right. The washing machine really doesn't care. Um, you know, it's going to be the master bath. It's going to be the kitchen. You know, it could be that powder room on the first floor. Um, what's being used a lot. So uh, put the valves where you seem you know, where it seems logical. I think in the house. So, and like Rick said, if you do up to six, no problems whatsoever. Definitely. I did see a question earlier, a little further back. Uh, About see, me... uh, commercial applications. I wanted to answer that one too. That was, oh, uh, go, yeah, go for it. That was a good one. Um, now I lost it. Can you guys see it? Is that the one from Gilbert about the 28 floors and 16 risers? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go. Okay. Yeah. One thing you have to be careful of with when we get into buildings that get tall like that is some of those actually have different pressure zones because of the way that the the pumps are used to to do pressure at each uh, different uh, uh, floor level. The one thing that you have to remember is you have to recirc per pressure zone. So like if I've got a, a 40 or 50 story building, I might have three pressure zones on that. And you would have to provide the research pump for each of those pressure zones. Luckily, they normally have equipment to serve those three different areas as well. And then we just circulate there. Where you run into problems, if you try to circulate and everything's down in the basement, then then we do meet, uh, we need the Benford 5000. <laughs> to overcome the static pressure from one pressure zone down to the bottom of the basement. There's just, we're getting into the weeds there a little bit, but uh, just be careful on that. Uh, uh, his question was really uh, uh, on the commercial standpoint, if you can't make one of our smart plugs work for one reason or another from a code restriction or whatever, because it does require the pump to have a pigtail, and it does require electrical connection and in some codes they won't let you do that in a plenum and some other things then you can always go to a standard honeywell or white rogers strap on aquastat that makes and breaks the power to the circulator and that works uh that works okay it it would be a good uh next step if you can't use one of our plugs very good excellent all right guys keep those questions coming in because i think we've got We've gotten most of them. I can't think. Yep. I'm just going, well, scrolling there's, back. There, there. There's one that was scrolled past. I, I want to bring that up from Dan Hernandez. Uh, and he was asking about the life cycle of a smart pump or even a dump pump with a smart control. Um, so this really comes down to the manufacturing of the circulators. And the engineers back at Taco will design our circulators to last a minimum of 250,000 cycles how many times it turns on and off in its lifespan. So in a heating pump, 
we equate that in a single zone system to about 18 years. So in 18 years, you might see the lifespan of the circulator. Now, you guys know you've seen circulators last a heck of a lot longer. Yep. Some of them might last a little bit shorter. It all depends on the cycles that you get out of the system itself. But it is all about a cycle count. And uh, the crap in the water. Do. And the water, too. Yes, yes, yep. definitely. So when we go after the ECM, we take care of the crap in the water uh, and hopefully make it last a heck of a lot longer in that respect, too. Yeah, and they tend to run a lot cooler, which helps. I mean, that's uh, yep. that's all part of the equation as well. Yep. It is a cooler temperature. They, uh, an ECM circulator does have a higher starting torque. Um, so there's, there's no downsides to switching over to ECM uh, out of uh, standard AC circulator world. Very good. All righty. We got a, a still have we still have, gosh we, this is amazing we still have 90 people out there on on this on this program so good good on good on y'all good on y'all thank you so if you're still on here after this time I I, I presume you have questions so please ask them um, you know I mean otherwise you want to listen listen to us yammer we can do that too but I, <laughs> we we I don't know I don't know about I can't speak for me but I know these two guys get awful tiresome after a while. <laughs> Kidding, kidding. It was, it Thank was you, a sir. joke. It was a yes, joke. It was said yeah. with love. All right. Thanks, Both boss. <laughs> we'll take that beating. Give me another. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah, the beatings will continue until morale improves. <laughs> <laughs> that is the Takeo Training Department motto right there. <laughs> All righty. We should. We really should come up with a motto, shouldn't we? Yeah. There's a, that's, what do you guys think? You, there's still. You're there's good still, at those, John. Yeah, well, there's still now we're down to about 87. What do you guys? Let's have a motto, all right? Oh, Travis asks about John's two sons. Unfortunately, the guys couldn't make it. Neither Ben nor John could make it tonight. Unfortunately, we were we were we were hoping that they'd be on, but I got an email just before the presentation that neither of them were going to be able to make it. Unfortunately, which uh, um, uh, there's uh, two great kids and uh, great kids, young men. They're both in their nice. 30s yeah. now, so they're not they're not they're not kids anymore. They're 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 fine young men and uh, and pretty cool. So good, really good guys in this country. Company is in really good hands, really good hands. Uh, someone asked about what are we going to be learning next week? Well, like I said, we said our, our earlier, we're taking, this is, school's out, all right? This is the end of the 10-part Takeo After Dark series. We are, we're good. We're going to take a two-week respite uh, to collect ourselves and get ourselves refreshed. And then we'll be back with summer school, all right? And we're going to be doing that every other week. Uh, we're going to come up with the first with the first uh, topic, and they're going to be random. And then what I, we think we're going to crowdsource the next topic. So during that presentation, we'll just have a poll open for everybody and pick one of these five. You guys pick what you want, all right? And, and we'll figure it out from there. And if you guys have any suggestions, this, this is good. This is what you guys get to do because you're the last group on still on. What would you like right. to learn? What yes. would you like to learn? Is there something we can do for you? That maybe we haven't thought of, because you know, you you spent ten week was it, weeks with us. You you know we have our limitations. <laughs> so. Hey, JB, guess yes. what I got here at my house? What do you got? Index cards. Oh, you got the index cards. I've got, from and I've got more up at the factory, so I got to get my hands oh, on some of good those. Good man, good man. I, so, there's a new there's a reason we kept those things. Yes. Yeah, so th those of you that have been to a factory training class in the past. Um, we usually ask you guys to fill out a index card on that one thing that bugs you about hydronics. What do you want to learn? What do you want to make sure you get out of the event that we're here for? So I've saved a couple of them. I've got a bunch of them up at the factory still. I'm going to get my hands on those too. And uh, we may be able to develop some training classes out of those too, uh, because those are the questions that you guys have had before the class started. So I did hang on to some of those. So we'll, we'll work on those. Right. Well, we did get a question from from Sam, and I'm not going to even try your last name, Sam, because that's I don't want to I don't want to don't want to butcher it. But uh, I was looking at, at the online calculator. It goes as far as inch and a quarter. So is the GPM usually based on the max pipe size, or can it be lower for the hot water recirculator? Now, Rick, I'll let you take that one. Um, that Sam, if you're talking about the one we just showed you and gave you the link to, it should only be going to one inch. <laughs> Uh, again, I, I hope it goes bigger than that, but eventually it will. It only goes to one inch, and the GPM uh, limitation that we will use is whatever the smallest pipe is on the return side of the system, or 
whatever the smallest pipe is on a system that does not have a dedicated return or a research line. So, uh, and, and that number is the maximum velocity limitation of two feet per second. So that's kind of what we're using as a general rule. It's conservative, uh, not really. The Plastic Piping Institute says that portion of the system, thou shalt not ex exceed two feet per second. So uh, we, uh, copper gives you a little bit of flexibility. You got between two and three feet per second on copper lines. So uh, anyway, I hope that answers your question. Um, I'm not sure where you saw anything in inch and a quarter sizes. If you're referring to our uh, calculator or our app that we just introduced to you. Very good. Here's one from Gilbert. Gilbert is in the Philippines. We didn't have. Yeah. So he Gilbert. has to go back to work. It's morning in the Philippines. Well, good morning. Yeah. Good morning, yeah. Gilbert. And uh, thank you. Thank, uh, hey, thank, thank, thank you for coming, Gilbert. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll see you. We'll look, really look forward to seeing you again next time. So uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us from the Philippines. Definitely. This has been thank you. We got Australia. We got the Philippines. We got Colombia. Yes. Uh, where else have we get we have we had people check in from in this in this uh, this globe of ours? Doesn't it make the world small? This wor yeah. this really is a world wide web. It is. You like how I tied that together? <laughs> hey, this murder hornet. You just knows realized that, didn't you? Huh? <laughs> yeah, this this murder hornet knows his geography. Okay. <laughs> and you didn't sound like Elmer Fudd when you said it. World wide web. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Dominic has a question. For tankless manufacturers that require a min and a max flow rate through water heaters, how do you maintain such flow rates at all times when using a recirc pump? We don't Again, have to. We don't our, have to. Well, yeah, we don't have to, and mm -hmm. your information from the manufacturer will give us that minimum. All we care about are the min and the max, as you're referring to. We won't exceed max because we're our velocity limitation gallons per minute will typically be lower than that and will be higher than the half GPM, which is typical for bringing the damn thing on in the first place. So but I don't, I think you don't have to worry about what you're questioning right there to the best of my knowledge. Yeah. One of the things that we didn't, you know, I mean, it was quickly showing you the app that we have there, but there is also a section. If you do choose a tankless water heater uh, on the system itself, um, you can, based upon the flow rate that you choose on this design, you can go to that manufacturer, go to their charts. They're going to show you based on a, they're going to show you a curve, you know, flow and head. And you go and find that additional head that you're going to throw in there. And that's also the great idea about using this circulator is setting that's it right. up for the flow that you want it to do. Yeah. That's what we designed it to do. So, when we jump back and, and, and go through some of these classes earlier where we start talking about uh, circulator sizing in the heating world, what do we always choose? A circ that is a heck of a lot bigger than what we actually need. Right. And yeah, that's it. Yeah. And we deal with it. We want that. you know. So, yes, we've got a bigger pump than what we need, and it's going to do fine. We're not going to overheat the house. We're not going to have any major detrimental issues in the system itself. But as we can see, when it comes to research, we can. So let's make sure we size it right and dial it to the, the flow that we want it to do. So that's, yeah. a, that's a very good question. Thank you. I'm going to give Terry Turner a, an award for perceptiveness. Perceptivity? For being perceptive. I'm giving Terry Turner an award for being perceptive. He asks, is that a Chowda Heads Murder Hornets t-shirt? Meaning he knows where I bought it online yeah chowder heads yes exactly chowder heads uh it's a chowder heads murder hornets t-shirt in terms of comfort are you able to tell that it is a poly blend and not 100 percent cotton yes it's not an uncomfortable t-shirt in any stretch of the imagination <laughs> I, I i i must i must stress that it's not an uncomfortable t-shirt i uh, would i prefer a full cotton one yeah i i, I could but it's a t-shirt mm -hmm. so it's not it's a, it's very comfortable but yeah i can tell it's not 100 percent cotton um, because you know, I'm just you know, comfort is important, and you know what, uh, touchy, I, what what my body is a temple, and and the kind of you know siding I put on my temple is very important. <laughs> very more than you wanted to know, Terry. So <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, Terry. Yeah, thanks for that, Terry. All right. <laughs> There's a visual I can't get out of my yeah. head now. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> he says very cool and inspirational. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say you should move to Utah with all that temple talk. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you know, say, hey, some people's bodies are temples, others are tents. You know, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> and Daniel Leary, thank you very much, Daniel. We'll see you in two weeks as well. Looking forward to it. All righty. And Stephen Quiet saying good night. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate it. Uh, Richard McGrath had his own little choice comment for the, <laughs> for the temple remark. Okay. <laughs> Visuals, new, 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 new thought, new thought, new thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do Alrighty, not go folks. to bed right after this. Yes. No, no, no. Is Mr. Messenbrink still with us, John? I always feel sorry that we, when we get going, you know, it's like, you know, it. We, when you got Mo, Larry, and Curly going here, Shemp just kind of watches off to the side. So we want to bring Shemp back in. John, are you still with us, or are you, are you have you taken a nap he or had, something? He oh, had a roll. I'm actually still here. I was just typing that. Oh, There's okay. I just got that. Okay, gotcha. Yep. There's a quote from a great movie, and it goes, "We're not worthy. We're not worthy." <laughs> you know, Mr. Cooper. <laughs> yes, and it ties into the whole school's out for summer. So thanks, guys, for putting us on ten weeks. What I mean, just great stuff. So thank you. Thanks for all that. All the people that uh, tuned in every week, and you know, we'll look. Look forward to uh, two weeks from now, and we'll start up some new some new stuff. Summer school. Uh, and John, thank thank you and 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 Eric and Tim for 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 uh, inviting us to yeah. do this. Thanks. So uh, much. This was really awesome, a great opportunity, and I, you know, a, a, as you can tell between the three of us, we kind of like to talk. <laughs> yeah. So so you know this was this was a lot of fun for us too, and we really really appreciate you putting this on, and we really appreciate everybody. Uh, joining in, uh, you know, it, 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 the numbers have been just incredible uh, for attendance, and the response has been great. And I'm glad we were able to help you guys out out there in in webinar land. So I hope uh, I really do appreciate that opportunity, John. Yes. Yeah. And what I'm just reading what Frank had said. You really make learning entertaining, and that's that's really what this is. So thank you. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, Good. We don't want to. You know, the, the worst thing you you don't want to see the three of us bored, because and nothing <laughs> good can come of that. <laughs> I I just it's it 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 would not be a good thing. <laughs> yeah. So John, John uh, at, at uh, mechanical, you guys, uh, you know, really put it together with great ideas and yeah. and uh, greatly appreciate for for throwing this. Uh, and and kind of like throwing it together in the beginning too you know yeah. it was it was a you know quick ideas and next thing you know um you know we went you know everybody just you know put our feet to the fire and started running with it so yeah um, yeah. yeah this was a yeah. great great thing to go through i i i, I thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it um, don't sell yourself too short with the candy land comment i mean you got <laughs> 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 I'll get, well, get you haven't seen those other you, guys, right? You, you yeah, might yeah. think we we're giving ourselves too much credit. Maybe we're more shoots and ladders. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say checkers, but uh, oh no! Hey, no. John, uh, Messenbrink, uh, you know, X to location is timing, and you guys had some really good timing on this. So again, kudos to Mechanical Hub for uh, making it happen at the appropriate time. Just boom, it happened, and. And lots of people jumped on, as we've seen week after week, and um, uh, couldn't have done it without you. So kudos. Well, thank you. And, and gents, I couldn't have done it without the two of you as well. I, I, I'm very lucky that I, uh, I'm kind of the head of the department, yes. uh, but they, they, they made very, very, they were very, very careful to put me in charge of people who really didn't need anybody to be in charge of them. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you know, I mean. When you when you got when you get guys like these two and then Rich and Brett, I mean, the only thing I have to do is it, the the only advice I've ever given to any of these guys is is basically this: I don't care what you do, just don't f it up. All right, and and they just take that ball and run with it, you know, and that's great, and that's you know good self motivated guys, and it's uh, it's beautiful beautiful to watch and. And and just great to see these guys become such great trainers, and and I learn a lot every time I hear both of them talk. So this is it's really really terrific. Travis, I've got one for you, Barba. Yeah. Oh, the biggest attendance we had during uh, one of these sessions, I think we broke 300 once. Yeah, um, that was cool. Right on. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think either right at 300 or, or just over. That was our biggest one. We've we've generally been over 200. Some of them we've been in the 170 to 160 to 170 range. Uh, but once we've got this thing going and rolling, uh, it was it was we were we were in the the 200 to 300 range mostly. Yeah. Yeah, I would say if we would average out all 10 weeks, I'd say we was out 200 a night. Yeah, I, I think you're probably right. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Maybe, oh, maybe a skosh higher, but yeah. It's that damn uh, daylight savings time. It was not takeo after dark anymore. That's right. That's right. Maybe we should do this later. Start at about 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. We'll see what happens. Uh, then, 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 then all kinds of creepy crawlies come out of the woodwork. Oh, God, I'll be <laughs> twisted by then. <laughs> by then, yeah, by then he says. I'd say twisted sister. Yes. <laughs> a pledge pin on your uniform. No, wait, that's a different. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, <laughs> all righty. Well, good. Hey, thank you, folks. And thank you out there. And we'll see you in about, uh, we're going to take two weeks off. So we'll yep. see you in three weeks, right? Yeah. Yes. Oh. Yes. Look for thank an you. email. Yep. Taking two weeks off. We'll see you in three weeks. And uh, excellent. And uh, no, Terry, you did not miss John three and Ben. They were not able to be with us, unfortunately. Maybe and when we start summer school, maybe we'll get them. We'll get them. Yeah. Yeah. Be yeah. Cool. They, right. they have to come to summer school now. Yeah. 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 That's it. They, they'll tell their dad on them. They'll be. They'll, they'll have to come to summer school. <laughs> oh yeah. There's a career incident. Just, just. <laughs> All right, Jason. Thank you for being with us. Terry. Thank you. Travis. Awesome as always. Appreciate it. Chuck. Steve. Everybody, thank you guys. And uh, again, Mr. Message Brink, thank you. And we will thank you for joining us for Takeo After Dark, the 10 part extravaganza. And we'll see you in summer school. <laughs> see ya. Bye bye.